for calling the meeting to order. This is uh, opening our virtual meeting at uh, five o'clock. The NBUSD Board of Education is holding a regular virtual board meeting tonight that all can participate in remotely. You can join via Zoom. Specific directions and how to participate are located on the Board of Education webpage on the district's website, nbusd.org slash board. The open session part of the meeting agenda begins at 7 p.m. Before going into closed session, the board is available for public comment on closed session agenda items. Is there any public comment on closed session items, Mr. Reese? There are no public comments at this time, President gonzalez Matos. Thank you, Mr. Reese. Seeing that there are none, the Napa Valley Unified School District will now adjourn into closed session. See you all at seven o'clock. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Elba Gonzalez Maris, and this is the Napa Valley Unified School District Board of Education. The NBUSD Board of Education is holding a regular board meeting tonight. All can participate in remotely. You can join via Zoom. Buenas noches, mi nombre es Elba Gonzalez Mares, y esta es la mesa de educación del Distrito Escolar Unificado del Valle de Napa, NBUCD por sus siglas en inglés. La mesa de educación de NBUCD está llevando a cabo una reunión regular esta noche, en la que todos pueden participar de forma remota. Puede unirse a través de Zoom. Interpretation in Spanish is available for tonight's virtual board meeting. To access interpretation from a computer, click on the interpretation icon on the bottom of your screen from within the Zoom application. On a mobile device, click on the more button on the bottom of your screen and choose language interpretation from within the Zoom application. This is a separate channel that will allow you to hear English to Spanish translation concurrently. Please note, interpretation services are not available when you join our meeting by calling in. Our interpreters for tonight's meeting are Paul Huertas and Claudia Lindgren. May we have one of the interpreters please translate these instructions on our English channel so our Spanish speaking families can hear the instructions. Buenas noches a todos. Los servicios de interpretación van a estar disponibles para esta junta esta noche. Para tener acceso a los servicios de interpretación, simplemente pueden fijarse en el, el, el icono. En el, uh, en el signo de, de mundo que está en la parte inferior de su pantalla uh, por medio de la aplicación Zoom. También por su teléfono móvil, uh, usted puede tener acceso uh, a los servicios de interpretación. Solamente oprima el botón que dice More y le va a dar el acceso de interpretación uh, del lenguaje y lo puede usted escuchar en un canal separado. Uh, desgraciadamente, los servicios no de interpretación no se encuentran disponibles y simplemente llama telefónicamente a esta junta. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Specific instructions on how to participate in the meeting are located on the Board of Education webpage on the district's website, nbusd.org slash board. Can we please start with attendance roll call from Vera Morales, Executive Assistant. Yes, Stu student board member Magaña. Present. Trustee Gonzalez Mares. Present. Trustee Jankowitz. Present. Trustee Gracia. Present. Trustee Reiser. Present. Trustee Water. Present. Trustee Shu. Present. Trustee Dooley. Here. Quorum present, thank you. Thank you, Vera. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Napa Valley Unified School District board meeting. Public participation remains virtual, online only, due to the COVID-19 shelter in place order. We continue in uncharted territory as we deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. As trustees, we have returned to the boardroom in solidarity with our staff, given that our school campuses are now reopened for our students. However, in order to ensure access to our meetings without any limitations during the persisting pandemic, we are continuing with online remote access via Zoom for the public and guests. I would like to thank our employees, our families, and the entire NBUSD community for how you have supported each other and come together during these unprecedented times. This meeting tonight is in accordance with the open meeting rules in the state of California for the governor's order. I'm going to start tonight with some basic instructions on how we are going to be using Zoom and involve the members of the community. All board of the trustees, 
and the superintendent are in video throughout the entire board meeting from here in the boardroom. Other staff members are present by video. By video. Members of the community <laughs> will not be on video and will be muted except during public comment. During public comment, any member of the community that wishes to speak must raise their hand using the raise hand feature in Zoom. You will be unmuted and will be provided three minutes to speak. There are two ways to make a public comment within the time allotted for public comment on an eligible agenda item. The comment by video conference, click the raise your hand button to request to speak when public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. When it is your turn to speak, your name will be called out. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comments. After the allotted time, you will then be remuted. Instructions on how to raise your hand are available on the district's website at nbusd.org slash board. To comment by phone, you will be prompted to raise your hand by pressing star nine. To request to speak when public comment is being taken on the eligible agenda item. When it is your turn to speak, the last four digits of your phone number will be called out. You will then be unmuted during your turn and allowed to make public comments. After the allotted time, you will then be remuted. Instructions on how to raise your hand by phone are available on the district's website at nbusd.org slash board. In addition, community members were allowed to submit comments via email at public comment at nbusd.org up until 8 a.m. this morning. Public comment received after 8 a.m. the day of the scheduled meeting will not be read into the record. However, the public comment will be announced as received after the deadline and it will be and it will become part of the meeting archive as long as it is received before the meeting is officially called to order. For every agenda item, I will prompt the meeting participants who have joined us via Zoom for public comment. Please follow the instructions just provided when you would like to comment on an item. We have been called to order and conducted our attendance roll call. We will go forward with our agenda. I will um, now ask uh, Trustee uh, Gracia to report on closed session items. Yes, uh, in closed session, the board took action to approve the following staff recommendations effective July 1, 2021. The following administrative appointments have been made. Amy Worrell to the position of assistant principal for American Canyon Middle School. And that is all that I have to report. Thank you, Trustee Gracia. We will now go to our next item, our flag salute. On that same note, let me ask you, Trustee Gracia, to lead us on the flag salute, please. I'd be happy to. If everyone would please stand and join me in uh, the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our announcement is that this meeting is recorded for live streaming and archiving on the district YouTube channel. For a detailed review of any item, any meeting agenda item, the archive video can be referenced located on the district's web, web page at nbusd.org. The public can join the virtual board meeting remotely via Zoom. Participation instructions and the process for public comment can be found on the district web page. Moving to our next item, which is approval of agenda. I will, prior to doing that, ask that we move item K1B after item G. All right, I'll move to approve with the amendment to move the item. I'll second. I have a first by Trustee Gracia and a second by Trustee Dooley. Student board rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed or abstain? Great, thank you. We'll now go to approval of our minutes. Um, I'll move to approve the March 24th, 2021 minutes. I'll second. The first by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Dooley. Student Board Rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
Maria. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Approved March 25th, 2021 minutes. Second. So first by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Dooley. Student board rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed or abstain? Mainly abstain, but we've all been here. Move to approve the April 8th minutes. Second. First by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Dooley. Student board rep? Aye. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody need to abstain or oppose? Great. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Masseni, do we uh, have any recognition of visitors and employee organizations tonight? Yeah, I believe that all three of our union presidents are present tonight. So I'm going to ask Mr. Ruiz if you can please um, unmute them. Um, I see Mr. Hector Gallegos here from CSEA. Yes, hi. Welcome, Mr. Gallegos. Thanks for being here this evening. Ms. Leslie Walder from NAPS. Can you please unmute her, Mr. Ruiz? Good evening, um, President Gonzalez Mares, um, Dr. Musetti, and members of the Board of Education. Thank you for being here, Ms. Walder. You're and welcome. Ms. Gail Young, President of NVEA. Good evening. Um, you have a big job tonight. And thank you for representing all of our students within this, this whole Hi. group. I represent uh, the teachers, counselors, and nurses within this organization. Thanks. Have a good night. Thank you, Ms. Young, for being here this evening. Thank you, and, and welcome to our meeting. Okay, we are now going to item F, which is recognition of students of the month. Uh, we will start with, uh, we have tonight, Napa Valley Adult Education and New Technology High School. So I would like to invite um, Principal Jones uh, to present the Napa Valley Adult Education Students of the Month, please. Good evening, everyone. I'm not Principal Jones. Uh, my name is Chuck Peckinpah. Is, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chuck. Is uh, Napa Valley Adult Education going first? That is correct. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Thank you, Chuck. My name is Laurel Leonard Broll. I'm the Career and Technical Education Supervisor at Napa Valley Adult Education. And I'm happy to introduce uh, two excellent instructors who will introduce our students of the month. Our ESL instructor, Catherine Gooch, will begin and she'll introduce uh, the uh, office assistant student. And our building and construction instructor, Chuck Peckinpah, will introduce our construction student. I'd like to ask permission to uh, let Mosh K in. Our student of the month, uh, Sitlali, has a, a different name on her screen, and it's Mosh. K C A Y E. If you could permit her in, uh, she'll say a few words after Catherine Gooch. Catherine, can you unmute yourself and begin? Thank you, Laurel. Good evening to everyone. I am in a classroom, so I will be keeping my mask on. I, I am with students, so I hope that you can all hear me. We'd like to thank the board for giving us the time for you to meet one of our excellent students at Napa Valley Adult Education. And you get to see the exciting work that your public funds are accomplishing. I'm Catherine and I'm honored to be here to introduce Sitlali as our student of the month. She's currently taking three classes with us and I'm in two different classes with her. She's in an EL civics class with me that focuses on employability skills and she's also a student in our office assistant tech skills class that is a collaboration between our ESL department and our CTE department. Sitwali is really the type of student who makes our job especially rewarding because she is highly motivated and she's truly taking advantage of the great opportunities that we have here at NBAE. We're so impressed with her commitment 
her desire to excel in her education and her wisdom in making a plan for the present that will allow her to obtain her goals in the future. We appreciate her positive presence in class and also her willingness to assist her fellow students. Perhaps one day we'll even see her as an employee in our district and maybe she'll be in one of these meetings. And now she's going to share with you a little bit more about herself and her goals. So Sitlali, if you're ready, you can unmute yourself. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank the school board for inviting me to speak tonight. I would also like to introduce my husband, David, and my daughter, Camila, who are here supporting me tonight. I am the proud daughter of Mexican immigrants. I was born in the US, but I have lived in, in Mexico for most of my life. I have a bachelor's degree in physical education from Escuela Superior de Educación Física in Mexico City. I am taking at MBA, oh, classes, sorry, at MBAE because I want to improve my skills with communication in general, learn new computer skills and get a good job. I want to continue my education, possibly earn a master's degree. So I am taking online classes with the hope of completing an online program in the future. My goal is to be a bilingual physical education teacher and personal trainer and help other people learn the importance and benefits of moving their body and being healthy. I love, I love to learn about everything and MBAE help, helps me and, and other adults to continue with their education. The teachers are very helpful. They make the classes interesting and easy to understand. I am grateful to them for their great, jo great job. In closing, I would like to restate that Nelson Mandela said, education is the first step for people to gain the knowledge, critical thinking, empowerment, and the skills they need to make this world a better place. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, Chuck, would you like to introduce your student? Yes, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Laurel. Thank you to the board. Uh, for giving us a chance to honor a uh, student of the month, uh, Jorge Ortiz. My name is Chuck Peckinpah and I teach building and construction at Napa Valley Adult Education. <clears throat> We've been holding our classes on Zoom up until late February when we began to meet in person on Saturdays. And that was the day I got to meet Jorge. <clears throat> During our first class uh, on our break, Jorge spoke to me about how much he and his father loved baseball. And uh, since I've been a big baseball fan all of my life, he and I really hit it off. So that first Saturday, um, I had forgotten some of my supplies and uh, Jorge provided me with much needed dry erase markers that he just happened to have in his vehicle. <clears throat> he then offered to bring his projector and sound system to class so we could watch videos. And now we are watching videos and projecting images onto the whiteboard, which is extremely, extremely valuable with the presentation of lessons. Jorge is a graduate of Napa High School, class of 2001, and he has completed some coursework out at Napa Valley College. He experienced some major, major health issues during his time at NBC, and which forced him to take a hiatus from academics. But I'm happy to say he's much better now. He excels with his academic work. He has perfect attendance and he makes a consistent effort to assist with translations from English to Spanish and Spanish to English for everyone in our class. He is highly engaged in the study of the material and is supportive, uh, and is supportive of the sense of community that exists in our unique classroom setting, both virtually and in person. So without further ado, my nomination for student of the month goes to Jorge Ortiz. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jorge Ortiz. Uh, thanks to my family that is here with me, but they just didn't wanna be on camera. 
Um, I'm attending the building and construction class. Thank you to my teacher, Mr. Peckinpah, the school board, and the Napa Valley Education, Napa Valley Ad Adult Education for selecting me as the student of the month. It is such an honor. After being diagnosed with kidney failure back in 2005, I was in dialysis treatment for about a year. In June of 2006, I had a kidney transplant thanks to my father that donated me one of his. Thank you, Dad, for the second chance to live. After the kidney transplant, I kind of didn't care about my education anymore because I thought I will have a very short life. Since then, I have taken some college classes here and there, trying to find the spark that would like my passion for education again. But that didn't happen until I started attending the building and construction class. My wife and the willingness to learn more about the construction trade motivate me to take the class. This class has motivated me to continue my education and currently attending, and I'm currently attending Napa Valley College, pursuing a business and an accounting major, no matter what my life expectancy is. I'm also planning on taking the QuickBooks class that the adult school offers. In the future, I want to be part of the management of an organization in the construction field. I'm very grateful that the adult school exists here in our community. Thank you for all the support and guidance through my education journey. The Napa Valley Adult Education has given me the second chance to education, like the second chance my dad gave me to life. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to present our students this evening. Thank you. The pleasure, I think, is, is definitely all ours here. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so now I would like to welcome uh, New Technology High School. Um, if Principal Susan Miller would like to come to the mic, please. Yeah, good evening, um, President gonzalez Morris, Dr. Mercedi, um, and school board trustees. Thank you for the opportunity tonight to celebrate some of the amazing students at New Tech High. I'm happy tonight to be able to introduce you to two of them. Um, and these both of these students have continued to really thrive um, in the last year, despite the challenges of hybrid learning. Um, the resilience that they've shown is, has really been remarkable. So our student of the month for January is Eric Toscano. Eric is a junior at New Tech High, um, and he's really emerged at our school as a standout leader. He has an exceptional academic record, and at the end of this semester, he will have successfully completed our CTE digital media pathway, and next year he'll be on track to also complete our CTE computer science pathway. His teacher shared that he's a strong leader with his peers and in his classes. He's very competent, um, and he really does go above and beyond in everything that he does. Because of Eric's hard work in digital media, um, he's become a very skilled and talented graphic designer, and I'm very proud to have a student like Eric represent New Tech High. So I'm very happy to introduce you to Eric Toscano. Hello, thank you. Um, I would like to start off by saying thank you to all the teachers, principals, and school, school board members I've had in my envious journey in it. Irene Snow Elementary, River School, and New Technology High School, the schools that had shaped my academic learning in a positive way, as well as thank you for working your best, getting us students engaged during this pandemic. Being in River and New Tech, where project-based learning comes into play, has helped me gain more collaborative and communicative skills. It used to always be hard for me to speak up during class because but because of the experience I've had in both of these schools, it has helped me tremendously to become less nervous and more confident when I speak. And thank you for the opportunities that has been given to me beyond the classroom, such as the Napa Lettered Art Festival and Napa Learns Virtual Learning Academy. And a special thanks to Ms. Gottfried for going above and beyond for students and has helped me steer in a direction where I wanna take my career. There's definitely a lot more thanks to give, 
But I want to end up by saying to my peers, if they're listening, um, take opportunities of interest thrown at you. Don't be hesitant. Go forward with confidence and be thankful. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, our student of the month for February is Malachi McAvoy. Malachi is a senior at New Tech High, and she's also a dedicated choir student at Vintage High. Malachi um, has had a perfect academic record, both in her classes, her classes at New Tech, at Vintage, and in her classes at Napa Valley College. Um, and in fact, when she graduates from high school this year, she'll have completed a, at least a full semester of UC transferable college coursework. Um, she has exciting plans for her life after high school that I hope she will share with you. Malachite's teachers describe her as creative, outgoing, confident. Mal Malachite has been an absolute pleasure to have as a student at New Tech High, and I'm very proud of her and the wonderful young woman that she has become. And I'm happy to introduce you to Malachite McAvoy. That picture is from, uh, is from last year because I wasn't able to get a picture for my senior year. It's so funny, I haven't seen it in a while. Sorry. Um, okay. uh, okay, I, I wrote a thing, I'm just gonna read that. I used to tell myself stories at 10 years old about why cherry blossoms bloomed as I walked past my dream school. They're signs I imagined left by the goddess of spring so that I won't lose my way. I never could tell the difference between dreams and reality. You see, I grew up in the Bay Area and we used to walk across the UC Berkeley campus on our way home. My mom would point up to the tower and say, make sure you work hard in school and someday you'll be going here as well. School always motivated me as a storyteller. After all, stories shape who I am. If I can dream it, maybe it can come true. I moved to Napa right after fifth grade. And since then, every story I've been proudest of has been one I wrote in my classes. My schools have challenged me to expand my skills as a writer, as well as a student. In freshman year, we were asked to apply for the Napa Valley J College Jessamine West High School Writing Contest. With that, and with every finished draft, my teachers pushed me to refine my use of language and imagery. After months of writing and rewriting, I was chosen by the college for first place. Without my high school, I never would have even applied. In sophomore year, my school hosted Attention Napa, a student filmmaking club with a short film screen to the Napa Valley Film Festival. That year, we found ourselves mentored by masters, most, most notably Francis Ford Coppola. Through the club, I was encouraged to start my journey in screenwriting, which has led me to take classes through UCLA Extension, where I've been taught directly by members of the academy. Since then, I've written my first three screenplays, and I plan to major in college in film. When I got my letters from colleges this spring, the one I was most nervous about was from UC Berkeley. I had worked my entire high school career. I had worked hard my entire high school career, but I didn't know if that meant that I was good enough. My heart started racing as I opened the letter up and I was happy to find that I had gotten in. And for as much as I've pushed myself these past four years, I know that it wouldn't have been possible without the dedication of not only myself, but the teachers who pushed me harder than I thought was possible to achieve and for the lessons that I've learned from my schools. And because over the course of these past four years, I've learned that the power of schools is to turn dreams into reality. Thank you, Malachi. Thank you to both Napa Valley Adult Education and New Technology High School for enjoy, uh, joining us tonight and for presenting your students of the month. Okay, uh, we are now gonna uh, go to item G, which this is the portion of public comments on non-agenda items. Members of the audience, audience may address the board on any school related matter that is not on the agenda. The board will not take any action on any issue raised during this section of the agenda in as much as board action is limited to posted agenda items. Speakers are requested to limit their comments to a maximum of three minutes. Mr. Reese, do we have any public comments on non-agenda items? 
Oh, um, Trustee Gracia, if you could report on the public comment on non-agenda items first. Apologies. No problem. Uh, public comments were received by email at public comment at edusd.org. These comments received by electronic written format have been forwarded and reviewed by the NVUSD Board of Education trustees. There are, were two that were received for public comment. Uh, Susan Bell, non-agenda public comment for the April 22nd board meeting received 42121. And <coughs> Kevin West, non-agenda public comment uh, in the USD board meeting 42221 received 42121. And those are the only public comments on non agenda items. Thank you, Tracy Gracia. Okay, now Mr. Reese, do we have any members of the public in the zoom um, that have raised their hand to speak on non uh, public comment and non agenda items? We do have uh, several hands up. Uh, President Gonzalez Maris, we'll, we'll start with Matt Clancy. Mm -hmm. We don't hear anything, Mr. Reese, Mr. Clancy. He has to unmute his mic. Mr. Clancy, can you unmute your mic to speak on a public comment on a non-agenda item? And just to remind everybody on the call, if you raised your hand and you're here to speak on item K1B in regards to school closure, you wanna raise your hand when that item comes. This is not the item to raise your hand on. So again, if Mr. Clancy, um, we can't hear you if you don't unmute your uh, mic. So Mr. Reese, can we go over to the next uh, person, please? Yes. Uh, let's go with Nancy Alberon. Hello, Nancy. Uh, good evening, President Gonzalez Mares, trustees, and Dr. Massetti. My name is Nancy Alberon, and I'm the superintendent of San Jose Unified, the largest district in Santa Clara County. I'm here today on behalf of my organization and the more than 3,000 employees that that work here, and most importantly, the 3,000 students that we serve to thank you profusely for paving the way for the districts, for many districts in the state of California, including mine, on how to safely return students to in-person instruction at scale. Your courageous leadership and commitment as a board and that of your superintendent, Dr. Massetti, and all of your employees have served as a bright spot and a role model for organizations like mine to believe it is possible. You probably already know this, but I really wanted to take the opportunity to tell you your employees are incredible. Dr. Massetti, for example, has shared countless resources and lessons learned, not just with San Jose Unified, but with districts across the, 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 the state, as I've seen on several panels that she has participated on and that I in webinars that I have joined. By collaboratively putting students first and safety at the forefront of the decision-making, it's been possible. I'd also like to thank Chief Business Officer Rob Manguala for taking the time to share a wealth of information and resources, not just with me, but with my team. Principal Monica Reddy and her incredible admin team, teachers and classified staff, hosted a team of high school principals um, there not too long ago and shared with us what is possible. It made an incredible difference in our successful opening yesterday. We returned 10,000 students. And finally, I really want to thank the Napa Valley Educators Association. Our T San Jose Teachers Association worked with President Gail Young, who organized an incredible panel that, that consisted of Elaine Balayan, Mike Wilmarth, Courtney Garcia, Kristen Pruitt, uh, who participated and, and just did an incredible job. This, this panel was recorded and shared across my organization. Our teachers were so grateful to hear from practitioners who've been doing this for as long as your teachers have. Uh, it was clear that this is hard, hard work, but most importantly, that it could be done if you believe. 
Uh, please know that in San Jose Unified, we are deeply appreciative of your willingness to share and to collaborate and know that the impact that you had goes way beyond um, the students in Napa. You have impacted the lives of the students in my system, more than 10,000 that are in person. And I know I can confidently say that I'm sure that impact uh, is across the state. So again, thank you. And if San Jose Unified can ever be a resource to Napa Valley, please know you can count on us. Um, and again, thank you. Thank you so much, Superintendent Alvaran. Next comment, Mr. Reese. Yes, uh, Lisa Lombardi. Good evening, my name is Lisa Lombardi and I would like to speak again about the Browns Valley Elementary becoming a TK through eight school. This is my third time speaking. I'm a parent of a fourth grader and second grader twins at Browns Valley. We have a strong interest in the decisions being made this year with regards to our middle schools. I am also the parent club president. We appreciate everyone involved with this process and the difficulty of the decision that will need to be made. My comments tonight are really about this very, very important issue. Speaking for many parents, we would like to seek an amendment to resolution number 21-23 to include the addition of a TK-8 school at Browns Valley Elementary School. Yeah. Ms. Lombardi, Valley, Ms. Lombardi, a TK um, school Ms. Lombardi, my apologies for having to interrupt you, but this, your comment is related to item K-1B. We welcome you back for that item. It is related, but it is not uh, an it, agenda. Ms. Lombardi, it is related. Yes. Thank you so much. Next comment, Mr. Reese. Yes, Bells 6MV. It's a, it's a, I'm sorry, Mr. Reese, did you say a name? Yes, it's bells underscore six MB FZPW. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I am going to reiterate some comments I made uh, regarding last Thursday's uh, Crescendo Equity Grading presentation. And I still would like to reiterate the questions that I brought up uh, after that meeting. Um, and they're kind of as follows. I'm still wondering, have there been complaints or a survey of parents and teachers stating that the grading system at Napa Valley Unified is insufficient? And if so, does community have the access to this information or the results of any surveys? I'm wondering who wants this equity grading? And did the CEO of Crescendo contact Napa Valley Unified? And if not, who requested the information on that program? And does the community know equity grading is being considered and who would participate in deciding whether to adopt this concept for grading? Would it be prudent to add yet another potentially costly and controversial program? And why not consider hiring more instructional assistants to support teachers and students in reaching their goals? And then lastly, is this the first covert step towards critical race theory? After watching Mr. Feldman's presentation on crescendo equity, I surmise the following. Mr. Feldman promotes the theory of equity grading based on prejudgment, one-sided perspective, and compartmentalization of students based on skin color and income. Mr. Feldman also makes a number of condescending assumptions that our teachers are unable to assess a student fairly and individually. Equity grading presumes that a child is automatically at a disadvantage because of his or her income and skin color. This promotes the false notion that it is indeed the color of our skin that matters rather than the content of our character. Mr. Feldman, the CEO of Crescendo, uses a phrase implicit bias to describe others. I submit that he is quite the epitome of his own implicit bias. I hope this item will come to discussion soon and that we will be adequately informed of what, what the, it is, as well as the, it is the community at large. And in closing, I'd like to say God bless our teachers and our students, and especially Jenny Burke, 
Lou Kenmuth and Aaron Soper. They're in poor health at the moment, but God bless them. And, and once again, God bless Dr. Musetti's continued recovery and good health. And thank you for allowing me to express my observations and ask questions. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Mark Sizelove. Uh, I'm going to address the river school issue, which I believe is later in the agenda. Yes, that's item K1B. Um, once okay. I call that item, you can raise your hand then. Thank you. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Nancy. Are you there, Nancy? You have to unmute your mic. All right. Okay, let's go to uh, the Sylvia Regalado Zaclo. Hi, good evening. My name is Sylvia Regalado Zaclo. I am a parent at ACMS in Canyon Oaks in American Canyon. And I also serve as the president of the ACMS PTO um, currently. And I know this is a very heavy night and I'd like us to just pause for a moment and look beyond. Um, Sylvia Regalado, um, this pertains to middle school redesign work. That's for item no, B1B. No, I my comment is more about the forward movement. Um, as we move forward, I'd like the board to consider a realignment and reinvestment in secondary curriculum that starts in middle school with strong pathways into high school that ensure that achievement gaps are addressed while accelerated students are given the opportunity to further thrive on their campuses. The return to a seventh, a seventh period day, a plethora of student driven elective choices at each campus, expanded after school enrichment programs, college readiness, campus cultures that nurture social emotional learning, are just some of the regalado, I'm going to also, as I did with previous comment, um, it is a related item. So thank you. Please return for item K1B, K1B, please. Um, next speaker, Mr. Reese. This concludes uh, item K1B. Yes, Mr. Reese. Yes, thank you. Yes, you can raise your hand. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reese. That concludes public comment on non-agenda items. So we will now move forward to our next agenda item as we have made changes to our item to move item K1B. Before we get started on item K1B, I will ask Trustee Garcia to please report on any public comment made to our, um, sent to our email address. Yes. Uh... Public comments were received by email at public comment at mvusd.org. These public comments received via electronic written format have been forwarded and reviewed by the MVUSD Board of Education trustees. Izzy Wizzy, uh, title was River Middle School Poem, received 41721. Debbie Alter Star. Middle School Equity Includes Geography, SES, Ethnicity, and More, received 42121. Ginny Vanta, Protect Harvest, exclamation point. Seek Harvest Alternative Solutions, item K1B, received 42121. Uh, Melissa Hillman, CEQA Fair Argument Public comment submittal for agenda item K1B, adoption of resolution number 21-23, approving closure of Harvest Middle School and reconfiguration of middle school into a language academy campus, determining that the project is exempt from California Environmental Quality Act, received 42121. Uh, Carl Freisinger, uh, Save River, Vote No, Ask Why, public comment. For, received 42121. Catherine Fleming, CEQA Fair Argument Public School Comment Submittal for Agenda Item K1B, Adoption of Resolution Number 21 23, 
approving closure of Harvest Middle School and reconfiguration of River Middle School into a Lake Winch Academy campus, determining that the project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act received for 2121. Zach Hillman against resolution number 21-23 received for 2121. Wendy Bell Trammy, middle school redesign, do the work needed to find another solution received for 2221. Deidre Wheeler, public statement regarding NVUSD should not close or reconfigure River Middle School to redistribute its social emotional learning program uh, received for 2221. Brooke Sines, item K1B, adoption of resolution number 21-23 uh, received for 2221. Uh, Deidre Wheeler, public statement regarding NVUSD for 2221 board meeting agenda item K1B adoption of resolution 21-23 received for 2221. Will Daly, the board is our voice in the middle school redesign decision received for 2221. And Lauren Daly, a vote of yes is not a financially sound decision received for 2221. Um, President Gonzalez Manes and Trustee uh, Gracia, I'd also like for the record to say that we received the following public comment after today's deadline. These public comments will be forwarded to the school board for review and will become part of the meeting archive. The senders included Mr. Chuck Maybear, Whitney Hahn, John Hannaford, and Lisa Lombardi. Thank you, Trustee Gracia and uh, Dr. Masseni. Okay, um, now we will address item K1B where we get started. I do want to remind um, our fellow trustees, especially our new trustees here in the room and, um, and the public in regards to um, the direction that we have through our bylaws when it comes to public comment. Individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board shall limit the total time for public comment on each item to 20 minutes. With board consent, the board president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing, wishing to be heard. The president may take a poll of speakers for or against a particular issue and may ask the additional persons to speak only if they have something new to add. So I want us to have that to um, take into consideration um, for tonight's comments. I know we held a special meeting uh, for this particular item and um, we have also engaged with the community uh, for several um, months and ways. And, um, and so with that, uh, we will look at how many hands are raised tonight. So I will ask the public um, to um, now those who have been joining us earlier, thank you for your understanding and patience um, to raise your hand for item K1B. Um, and, um, and now I will ask um, maybe um, Mr. Reese if he could tell us the number of hands raised at this point. Uh, the number of hands raised at this point is 17. Okay. Then um, I think um, seeing that 17 hands are raised, we will, um, that's for approximately an hour um, of time. Um, then we can, I will um, encourage that we go ahead and do that. Does that, I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads that we are okay with that. Okay, so let's um, have our 17 speakers um, be ready to, to do that. But before we get started, um, did you want to say something, Dr. Masseni? Yes. Um, thank you, President gonzalez Mares and NVUSD trustees. I do have some information that I'd like to share with the board uh, to introduce this agenda item before you listen to public comment, deliberate, and take action tonight regarding um, Resolution 21-23. 
the information I'm going to share um, in advance of public comment and your deliberation and decision making um, is regarding the transition plan and immediate next steps that I'll be asking my staff to take if indeed the school board uh, votes to approve this resolution, which does articulate our staff recommendation for school closure and consolidation at the middle school level for the 22-23 school year. If resolution 21-23 passes this, this evening, I will be directing staff to work on the following immediate next steps to support the best transition possible through these challenging circumstances. And I thought it would be in the best interest of the board for you to sort of hear our transition plan in advance of, again, your deliberation and decision-making. These are not the only actions staff will take, but I think they are some of the most important and the most relevant to inform your decision tonight. As trustees, we want you to have knowledge of the most critical next step, next steps my staff will be taking beyond just the phase two programmatic planning that Assistant Superintendent Pat Andrew Jennings presented at last week's special board meeting. If, if indeed you vote to approve the staff recommendation to close Harvest Middle School and reconfigure River Middle School. So what are the next steps for staff? Um, this is a a lengthy list. So I want to thank everyone in advance for their patience. Um, the first is around immediate transition support, uh, meetings and support for staff and students. Um, my staff will be holding informational meetings with both the Harvest and River staff in order to lay out expectations around student placement and transitions into new schools and some of the information that will be critical to understanding potential staffing reassignments and options for the 2022-2023 school year, which is the proposed implementation year for the school closure and reconfiguration proposal you have before you this evening. In addition, we'll be providing staff with talking points and suggestions to support them in discussing school closure matters with students in the classroom, as we know that this difficult decision will impact students. Lastly, staff at Harvest and River will be receiving support from our student services team in response to the emotional impacts of school closure on employees. These same socio-emotional supports led by our student services department will be made available to students as needed. Next is support for families. Um, information and communication will be provided to the potentially impacted families over the course of the next few weeks if you vote to pass this resolution this evening. The communication will be focused on our student placement and transition plans for students. As we know, this decision will bring forth anxiety for families at the impacted schools. Parents will be made aware of their enrollment options for the upcoming 21-22 school year in case they wanna change any of their enrollment plans for next year, and they will learn about their options for, 22, for the 2022-2023 school year. I will allude to some of the options we're committed to providing. We will also be sharing these you know, in writing with staff and parents in upcoming scheduled communications. For the River Middle School community, um, I wanna let uh, the community staff uh, and our school board know that if the resolution passes, the current sixth and seventh grade families will learn that they will be able to finish their middle school experience at River if they choose. The current seventh graders, which would be next year's eighth graders, we would propose that they finish at River Middle School in the current River configuration. The current sixth graders, which would be next year's seventh graders, will also be allowed to stay, but will experience the programmatic shift vis-a-vis -vis the new language academy program model in their eighth grade year. What does this mean? Details are still to be worked out, but at minimum, they will be provided the opportunity to jumpstart their language learning in Spanish before transitioning to high school. The current fifth grade families, which would be next year's sixth graders, who open enrolled into River Middle School for the 21-22 school year will be allowed to stay for their sixth grade year, given that the implementation year is the following. However, they will not be able to stay automatically for their seventh or eighth grade year unless they open enroll into the new language academy for seventh and eighth grade and are granted a spot based on space and availability. These fifth grade families will be, and that's again, rising into sixth grade next year, will be contacted in the next couple of weeks by our enrollment department staff 
They will be given the option to remain at River for their sixth grade year if they wish, or will be provided the opportunity to reconsider their decision and enroll into another school, given the impacts of the potential decision this evening. Please remember that these options are unique to students and families in the River Middle School community because the campus on Salvador in our proposal is remaining open and undergoing a programmatic reconfiguration to a language academy. For the Harvest Middle School community, these circumstances are slightly different for Harvest the camp, because the campus in our proposal is actually closing in the 22-23 school year. We will be redrawing the middle school boundaries in the next coming months. Harvest families will learn what their homeschool option is, and then they can determine if they'd like to open enroll into other middle schools in the district for the 22-23 school year. Again, the implementation year of the proposed resolution. In addition, our sixth and seventh grade families who would like to consider another enrollment option given the school closure decision, if you all vote yes on the resolution, will be provided the opportunity to transfer to another school of their choice if they wish for the upcoming 21-22 school year as well to the greatest extent possible. Our next year sixth and seventh grade dual immersion students who will be our seventh and eighth grade dual immersion students in the 22-23 school year will be automatically given placement and enrollment priority at the new language academy. DLI parents will be given the opportunity to let us know if they do not want the automatic placement at the new language academy at the River Campus in the 22-23 school year. Most importantly, I want to share that we will need to provide on the ground enrollment support for Harvest resident families, and we are deeply committed to doing that. Our Harvest resident families will be provided with access to an enrollment session between the summer and early fall. We will hold these enrollment support meetings at the Harvest campus, essentially taking our enrollment office into the field. We will ensure Spanish speaking staff is available to work with the families. Our parent engagement office led by Ms. Viviana Loera will be working in partnership with the enrollment team under the direction of director Chris Gross to provide support to our Spanish-speaking Latinx families during these sessions. Parents will learn about their student placement options, the transportation services that will be available to them, and about before and after school programming services. We plan to keep a before and after school program option at the Harvest campus in the 22-23 school year if the demand is there, and we may be able to offer this option at the Harvest Middle School campus beyond 22-23, but the feasibility of this will be, of course, impacted by our property disposition strategy and timeline. For the dual language immersion program and the new language academy, I'd like to also highlight a couple of critical next steps. First, the instructional services division staff and principals Ms. Alejandra Uribe and Ms. Helen Roca We'll also be asked to hold informational meetings with our Napa Valley Language Academy and Pueblo Vista families in the next few weeks. Our DLI families will learn about the vision of the Language Academy that you find in the proposed resolution and our commitment to the dual immersion middle school years program and all of the associated improvements. Again, NVLA and PV families will learn that they have priority enrollment and automatic placement at the new language academy unless they wanna choose another option. In addition, um, Assistant Superintendent Dana Page announced this last week, but I'd just like to reiterate it as a critical step. We will be hiring and appointing the new language academy principal who will not technically start in their new role as principal in the, until the 2022-2023 school year, but we will appoint and name that principal in the immediate um, near future because we need that principal to begin working closely with the instructional, the instructional division um, on the task of program development um, immediately after their appointment. On the topic of small learning environment options and social emotional learning, these, both these topics have come up repeatedly through all of the community input we've received up until tonight. First and foremost, we want the board to know that we are committed to creating a strong sense of community safety and inclusiveness at our middle schools, even as they get potentially larger 
and involve the merger of various school populations. Through all of the opportunities for community input, input during town hall meetings, last week's special board meeting and in writing, we've heard concerns that larger middle schools are not for everyone. So for this reason, and in response to community input, I'm directing Assistant Superintendent Pat Andrew Jennings and her team to explore and research the viability of a K-8 program model as we engage in this transformation of our middle school landscape. I've personally reached out to school districts who have both succeeded and failed with K-8 models to learn about how to deploy a K-8 strategy successfully. Our team plans to tour and meet with these districts and schools as we consider implementing this new model in NBUSD. We will be engaging in a feasibility analysis, again, if you pass this resolution this evening, for pilot K-8 models to be implemented in the 2022-2023 school year at both Shear Elementary and Browns Valley Elementary. Many students who will be impacted by the Harvest Middle School closure might benefit if the K-8 option is made available to them since we have students who live in the Harvest re Attendance resident area attending both of these elementary schools, Browns Valley and Shear. Parents will be surveyed immediately at both elementary schools to first assess demand and interest. The survey results and feasibility study will determine if we start implementation of the pilots with our current fifth graders who are rising sixth graders, next year sixth graders at both of these sites or if we need to wait until the 2022-2023 school year to have more time for recruitment of interested families. After learning from the implementation of these pilots for a couple of years, as we redesign our middle school landscape, we will determine if the K-8 model in NVUSD is sustained and scaled. The K-8 work will be led by our Director of Elementary Curriculum Instruction and English Learner Services, Mr. Matt Manning. We want to also recognize that there is a need to systematize our social emotional learning approach at the middle school level, especially again as our schools get larger in size. We heard repeatedly about the success and positive impact of the model River has implemented over the last couple of decades. The River educational model can be viewed as an overlay or student support approach which can be incorporated into an educational program. We believe that every middle school student should experience the benefits of social emotional learning. The signature structures and practices at River, which include a more personalized learning approach, an advisory structure, strategic teacher teaming, and a laser-like focus on social emotional learning are incredibly valuable. We all know that these structures and practices have been implemented in the small school setting, the smaller middle school setting at River School. Our instructional services team is confident based on both research and practice that these structures can be implemented at larger comprehensive middle schools. And we look forward to scaling and implementing in the new larger settings if you indeed pass the resolution. Again, we look forward to bringing some of the elements of the River educational model to our large comprehensive middle schools. The phase two middle school redesign work group will be studying, designing, and preparing for consistent implementation of social emotional learning curriculum at the middle school and a standardization of structures that create a smaller learning com community at our larger comprehensive campuses, which will include structures like advisory periods and team teaching models. So more to be learned there. This critical work in the middle school redesign process will be led by our new director of secondary curriculum instruction in English learner services, Ms. Monica Reddy, in partnership and collaboration with Ms. Sarah Knox, our director of intervention and prevention services. In closing, as the board listens to more public comment this evening and then deliberates and prepares for a very difficult decision, I once again wanna recognize the challenging nature of the work we are doing. It's very difficult work. If the board approves the proposed scenario and staff recommendation, we know tonight's decision will impact the lives and the educational journey of our children. Students, families, staff, and communities 
at large will experience loss, pain, and disappointment. However, as a superintendent of schools, I also know that if the district works hard and handles this potential transition with lots of support, care, attention, and empathy, that new opportunities will lie ahead. And these changes, if implemented successfully, can actually ensure improvements in the educational experiences of our students at the middle school level, sustainably and with equity. I want the board to know that I have the utmost confidence in my staff and team to implement the transition successfully for our NVUSD community if you do indeed approve resolution 21-23 this evening. Lastly, as you all know, we have received lots of input about saving our schools. Saving our schools is exactly what we're doing, even though it doesn't feel like it. None of our schools exist in a vacuum. Each of our campuses depends on the viability of all the district schools. We must have the ability to reorganize and improve the district's campuses and programs before the burden becomes too great in response to the external factors that are putting this pressure on the district. The only way we can continue to succeed through all we have been through is to adapt develop and renew our commitment to our students and families. The only way we made it through the greatest threat in the history of education this last year where schools were literally shut down by the pandemic was to develop and adapt unimaginable models of education, which included both virtual and hybrid classrooms. The educational success for our children depends on improvement and evolution not just maintaining the status quo. We must have the ability to adapt and develop our assets when faced with problems and challenges that require problem solving. We have to be responsible and forward looking. We can't just hope for a better future. We must make changes to develop a better future for all of the children in the Napa Valley Unified School District. So um, I support the board as you engage in this difficult uh, decision tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Massetti. Okay, so Mr. Reese, let's go um, and start with our first public comment. All right, uh, Ashley. All right, can you hear me? Yes. There we go. Okay, um, well, well, first I wanted to just say I was beyond inspired by the students of the month. Um, that was, they were amazing. Um, and just cheers to all of them. Um, second, um, I'm gonna change my comments a little bit based on um, what Dr. Musetti just addressed in the transition plan. Um, and I wanna commend the task force for, for the difficult work they, they had to do. I, I personally work in transformation and I know it's very hard. Um, I'm speaking to propose that you that you include an amendment to include Browns Valley um, as K through eight as a part of the resolution number 2123. Um, I think Dr. Musetti outlined the reasons nicely, and I um, I propose that the pilot starts this coming school year. Um, you know, I I think that piloting this program at both Shearer and Browns Valley would enable to, to create accessibility for the community. Um, Browns Valley students primarily attend Harvest and River and, and, and those options, it sounds like may be eliminated if the proposal is adopted. By turning both of those schools into a K through eight program, um, it would at least give students an option closer to home, um, as well as provide a, a smaller, smaller learning environment. Um, for those students. Um, we have a wonderful principal, Bronze Valley is ready to go and welcome. And we have a very supportive parent community that uh, would, I think, help ease the transition as well. And I know a lot of people wanna speak, so I am going to stop there and give some time back. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker. Yes, uh, Nicole Clancy. Hi, um, 
Thank you for the chance to speak to the trustees and, and also to the members of our community. Um, the district is really just systematically stripping our children of the educational diversity. They've shut down Mount George, Yonville Elementary's gone down. They're trying to shut down River and Harvest. They've eliminated the Legacy Youth Project slash ethnic studies, as well as international baccalaureate programs in our district. Now they're coming after the social emotional learning program. And I mean, make no mistake, I, I, I believe Stonebridge will be next. I believe New Tech will be next. I believe AP High School courses could be next. And I, I just see this as erasing our proud Napa legacy of educational diversity. Um, trustees, you have heard the resounding and united voice of this community. Stand up and do what's right. Do what's being demanded by the people of Napa. I still have faith that you have seen this process for what it is. It's flawed and rushed. It has a self-serving agenda. And I just want to mention on, um, on Tuesday, the Napa police showed up at my home and um, stated that a board member, sorry, um, felt unsafe because of my husband's email. Uh, the officer said that the board member was threatened by the term personal liability. My 12 year old daughter was home when it happened and she was terrified. So we can add that as another trauma to her growing list. Um, I was in disbelief. And just let me add that my daughter Molly had a speech prepared tonight asking the board to think about her four R's of river when making your decision. And um, now she doesn't wanna speak in front of grownups um, that had called the police on our family. So this intimidation tactic is not gonna stop me from speaking up. Uh, we'll keep writing letters to everyone who'll listen. We'll keep climbing the administrative ladder and um, we're gonna just march down any and every avenue to right these wrongs. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Ms. Therese. Yes, Sarah. Hello, I'm at a loss, especially now considering it sounds like Dr. Mastetti is expecting your vote tonight. It sounds like this is a done deal. I spent weeks trying to understand how a school board tasked with maintaining quality education for an entire town's children can so easily discard hundreds of those children in favor of a small program you're hoping will grow. It's very clear that you want that particular program to grow at any cost. And the kicker is I hope it grows too. We have several very good friends with kids in that program. And ironically, it's funny, None of them knew that this was going down, nor do they support it. I've, I've sent the board multiple emails and, some, and to some of your credit, you've responded. Some of you at length. The problem with your response is the tone. It's very clear that you're trying to convince yourself that this is the right decision. The problem is that it is fundamentally and unequivocally wrong. It is a blatant disposal of our children in favor of a few. It feels like you're trying to create a divide in our program versus their program division. And I can tell you without question or hesitation, that won't happen in our house. There will not be a divide. I will love my friends' kids just as much tomorrow as I do today. And I will continue to enjoy watching them grow and thrive. And I will always do anything and everything I can to help them in that process. However, if you, if you vote to close both River and Harvest tonight, the message you are sending will be blatantly clear. That message is that you are not willing to work harder to find an equitable solution for all children. And since I don't have a voice in that decision or at least one that matters to you, I will spend the next one to three years. And I've noted that three of you will be up for reelection in 2022 in the next three and 24. I will spend that time actively campaigning to get you off this board. You have no business sitting in those seats when it is so clear how disposable children are to you. You need to know that I will spend every day for the next one to three years talking to every neighbor I see at every play date that we go to, every ball game we attend, every dance recital, back to school night, every backyard bar barbecue. I will actively campaign to get you out of office. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's the power of voting. I am asking you, no, I'm actually begging you and I realize time is of the essence, but you have to get this right. All of these kids need you. We need you to find a better solution. That's it. Thank you for your comment. 
Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Jody. Hi, thank you for hearing my comment. Um, I'd first like to say thank you to Dr. Massetti and to the board. Um, your comments this evening, Dr. Massetti, with regard to the changes that are happening uh, potentially, um, you know, brought near tears to my eyes. I hearing the the those parents of students at River and Harvest. Um, you know, it must it must be hard. I have a child at Browns Valley. He's in fourth grade. Um, I'm on to advocate for the TK through eight program at our school. Um, but I can't imagine the heartache of your school closing, a school closing. So I, I can't, you know, I, I wish there was a better way. I have to um, trust that decisions are made because there isn't a better way. And if that's the case and those schools are closing, uh, that brings up, you know, making Browns Valley uh, and Shearer uh, as a pilot programs an amazing opportunity to see if a TK through eight is indeed a good solution. Um, I know personally that, um, you know, River, River would have been our choice, <laughs> you know, um, and Harvest would have been our school that, that we went to if we didn't get uh, into River. And so knowing that um, my son would go into, you know, a, a bigger pool, you know, a, a bigger ocean of, of fish, you know, it, it's hard because, it, you know, it's hard when you're when your child is is uh, put into such a big, I don't know, a big environment um, that and I think sixth grade is, is young to be in middle school. And so I guess those things together, the sixth grade and then the, the big middle schools and not having a small school option. And um, I, again, the closing of Harvest, I think that opening a K through eight at BV is a good way of giving the Harvest families another option as well. Um, maybe, addressing the declining enrollment, uh, people will be more potentially inclined to stay in um, the public school program, knowing that they had a K through eight program or TK through eight program um, as a viable option. So I just wanted to express my support for that program and uh, thank you guys all for your hard work. And that's all, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Obis Thunison. Hi, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Kobus Thunison. I'm a parent of two boys who went to River. And uh, I just wanted to share that, um, you know, the life lessons they learned there were incredibly valuable. Um, I won't go into all the details why the river program works, worked so well for them. But I have to say, listening to the call last week also, it became more and more apparent that, um, you know, there were many families that had similar experiences. And um, I just felt I wanted to share that losing this choice in Napa uh, just seems like a very sad decision. And I feel we really must take a pause to reevaluate this. Um, you know, it's a major destructive decision. Uh, you know, it, it, it reminds me of that, of the saying, measure twice, cut once, you know, it's just, it feels like the type of decision that needs another measure. Uh, I'm sure that I, I've only heard a fraction of what you all have heard and considered already, but there seems to be compelling evidence to suggest that voting to close two middle schools this evening is not a sound financial decision. Um, there has not been adequate analysis of the associated costs and loss of revenue to the district, as far as I could see. Um, and, you know, I'm also very afraid that there are un, uncalculated new costs that will really come from consolidating to the three middle schools. And I have to wonder how much of that savings of closing river and harvest would, would really be realized versus just, uh, you know, dumping it into, into trying to fix what we broke. Um, of course, there's, you know, other costs that I was wondering about, like busing and other transportation related costs that will increase. Um, you know, and, and then what I've heard from a lot of uh, a lot of families is the very real potential loss of revenue for for families who uh, who leave NVUSD. 
Um, I know it's a question whether people would really do that, but I've heard a lot of people mention that they would. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just feel like this is such a big decision. I, I, I'll just go back to my, my feeling like this is a measure twice, cut once type situation. And my, my ask is that the board decides to take another look at this, take another month, convene a new task force, you know, that can run independently, but with the cooperation of the school district and, and really look at what do all the middle school families really want? Get a balanced view from that and uh, include some of the experts from city planning, finance and education. Um, and let's make a real plan that, that doesn't get us back into the same problem in two years. I realize that sounds idealistic, but cutting, cutting these two schools um, without really giving it another, another shot, giving it another, another look just feels wrong. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Ruiz. Mr. Ruiz, next speaker. Yes, Maria Lorena Casares. She has to unmute her mic. Hi, now you can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Last time I was waiting and I don't know what happened, but I'm agree with Sarah and the last lady, she said the police showed to her house. But now we need to be, we need to speak up like one community. We need to fight for our schools. It's no okay the way that you guys deciding what's the best for our children. You guys thinking about money. You guys thinking about buildings. Please, please, I begging you, don't close river. Don't close harvest. Don't put those two programs together. Please listen to us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Mark Sizelov. Hello. Yes. How are you? Good. Good. Um, I had two sons go through uh, River School. One's gone on to get three engineering degrees. Another one's become a very successful artist. And then tonight I hear that Eric Toscano attributes some of his success to River School. And for that reason, I think it'd be a shame to close that. By looking at the superintendent, it looks like the decision has been made already, which, which I think is sad. But I think we have an extraordinary school there. And um, one of the reasons I know that is I was on the board of River School with Linda Inlay while Patrick Sweeney was part of the was a superintendent and it was just extraordinary. And the district has invested in this school. I mean, if you think about it and you drive by Salvador now, I mean, it's extraordinary. So why would you walk away from that investment? I mean, it's just extraordinary what they've done from River School being this little tiny place in a building to what it is today, I mean, I just, from a business standpoint, I just think it's it's a bad move. Um, but anyway, I look at uh, return on investment. That's how I look at things. And I also look at all the work that we put into this school, parents, kids, the community. And it would be just a shame to close that down. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Lisa Lombardi. Hi again. 
I hope I can finish my comments this time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Musetti, for your comments regarding um, your immediate next steps. It's great to hear that the district is seriously considering our BV TK through eight proposal. Um, but speaking for many parents, we would really like to seek an amendment to resolution number 21-23 to include the addition of a TK-8 school at Browns Valley Elementary School for the vote tonight. Making Browns Valley a TK-8 school is part of the solution. This isn't just about Browns Valley. This is about preparing our school district for the future. We strongly believe a successful TK-8 model at Browns Valley will open the possibility for similar models at other elementary campuses as a solution to the reality of ongoing declining enrollment. And it is also great to hear that SHEAR is also being considered. Uh, aside from the well-known positive research of K-8 school environments, there are other benefits to opening a K-8 school. Each year, Browns Valley loses 12 to 15 students to private schools. Um, that is a loss totaling 120 to 150,000 per year to Napa private schools. It is important for us to consider how we attract, retain, and reclaim families that are choosing between MVUSD and private schools, especially now if this proposal or resolution is voted on tonight. The solution of a TK-8 school would broaden the product base of MVUSD's offerings. We think most of you are in favor of this proposal and we appreciate your thoughtful consideration. But if you do have an objection to our request to move forward tonight on adding a TK-8 school to Browns Valley, we would like to hear your thoughts so we can have a conversation. Um, this is the end of my prepared comments and I just, do want to say thank you again to everyone. And I know tonight is definitely one of the tougher ones for you. And um, I do appreciate uh, all that you do for our community and for our school district. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Sarah W. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Witt and I am a Browns Valley parent. I would like to voice my support of converting Browns Valley to a TK through eight school. We would love to help pilot a public K through eight option along with SHEER for the Napa Valley Unified School District with hopes that it could expand to other campuses in the district. We're ready and excited to take sixth graders this August, which could provide for some continuity, continuity of education for students facing possible middle school closures in another year. We have a strong leadership and a wonderful school community that could provide another option for many students that might not thrive in a large middle school setting. And we could possibly retain students that might opt for a, a private K through eighth for their middle school years. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Dr. Tanya Mahafon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Massetti, the Napa Valley Unified School District Board of Trustees, parents, and community members. I am Dr. Tanya Mahapan, a pediatric optometrist. As health care providers of the children of the Napa Valley, we are requesting that you delay any closures of the Napa Valley Unified School District schools until the school year of 2023 to 2024, instead of the next projected date of 2022 to 2023. The following reasons are stated below. Many students will be returning back to the Napa Valley Unified School District when five-day in-class learning resumes. This will allow more accurate and up-to-date enrollment numbers to use for middle school redesign. Announcing this closure of a middle school, <clears throat> just as students are returning to school for the year of 2021 to 2022, has already caused additional stress to students. We are requesting that someone from pediatric healthcare be involved with the task force and planning of a middle school redesign. We understand that the Napa Valley Unified School District needs to downsize and school closures will need to be made. We are requesting that 
we be involved in this whole restructuring of the Napa Valley Unified School District pre-K through 12th grade. Our input can, be, um, can help with a systematic and long-term approach to the help the children of Napa Valley have the best educational experience for many years to come. This letter was supported by Dr. Greg Beach, optometrist and his wife, Robin Beach, Dr. Matani from Eye Care Specialist, Elaine Gomez, nurse practitioner from Napa Valley Pediatrics. The other pediatricians would have supported this letter, but they are lacking information. And that is where I would like to ask the board to abstain from any votes until we get more information. The information that we would like to have is how is this, these two school closures going to affect the mental health of our students of Napa Valley? We do not want them to end up at Valley Oak or Camille Creek. Those are the people that students that have behavioral and substance abuse. We can help these children before that happens. What percentage of children in Napa Valley have they attend private school? Have you surveyed these parents? Why have they left? Have we exhausted all other funding options? This is new with the idea of the K through eight. How did these schools, how did you choose these schools? This is a totally new option. These decisions and this feasibility study needs to be done before any decisions need to be made. There should be no amendments to this proposition. I strongly encourage you guys to please, please think of the children of Napa Valley. These are students now and for the futures to come. Thank you so much for listening to my comment. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Matt Clancy. Yes, hello. Um, can you hear, guy, hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, you know, NVUSD has been losing students since 2014. Uh, 1,382 over six years does look like a trend. Uh, the board and superintendent are using the King Report that further suggests that we're going to lose 4,000 students by 2028. If you believe this trend will continue indefinitely, MVUSD will have no students by 2068. It, it sounds ridiculous, right? But it's, it's how you analyze these numbers that makes them powerful. I don't believe it because I live here. A Sacramento consulting firm and Dr. Massetti wouldn't understand what occurred during these times to properly analyze this information. So why are we losing students? In 2014, Napa was rocked by a 6.0 earthquake. It was terrifying. People lost their homes and moved. 2017, we were surrounded by fire. People lost their homes and moved. An another fire in 2020, people lost their homes and moved. COVID, many lost their jobs and moved. We only lost 1,400 students in these six years. And that seems small. These are not trends. These are a series of consecutive life events that changed Napa's landscape and community forever. Without tragedy, we will not keep losing students. The King Report points out that we will gain 965 new students with ongoing construction. That's encouraging. Napa city and county are working to create affordable housing. What is MBUSD doing to create more students? Cutting Mount George and, and Yonville? Now cutting river and harvest, what message does it send to families of, of moving to the district or, or those who already live here? We're scared of Napa's future under people who don't understand what Napa is and what we've gone through. More importantly, how we feel about our schools and its legacy. I, be, I believe in Napa to rebound. I know we will. I ask the board to believe in Napa Valley as well with their vote. Remember we, where we've been and what these numbers really mean. The board of trustees should understand this. There's opportunity here that's being overlooked. River has a waiting list and is a top performing academic middle school in Napa Valley. River is costly, but SEL meets the needs of the students and should be expanded to draw in families. It's in high demand. Equally expensive is a DLI program that has been losing students and will replace River. It's a fantastic program, but when we can't maintain the numbers, Another report by someone outside the area will suggest that we cut that as well. The board needs to have more depth and creativity in finding solutions and make better, more well-informed decisions. Stand up, Napa strong, or stand aside. Without all the information looked at by every single angle, you must vote no. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. 
Next speaker, Mr. Ruiz. Uh, Will Daly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, hello, Ford and Dr. Massetti and Napa. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. You know, I think if we look at the outcome just on paper of uh, what the proposal is, what we're essentially saying is we're going to close two popular programs, replace it with a program that's needed but never has been particularly popular or not as popular as the ones we're eliminating. It's a great program, absolutely, but Napa hasn't chose it over the other ones. Um, it's, it's an odd proposal. Um, especially when you say that it's to save money and the actual amount of money it saves is one, not huge, and two, is, is subject to debate. Uh, you know, it's, the proposal has raised a lot of questions that we haven't answered. Um, there's a lot of wishful thinking of, well, then we're going to do this and it's going to be great. We're going to add 400 students to Silverado and Re Redwood and it's going to be great. And we're going to move DOI to the River Campus and it's going to be great. But we've done no real research to do that, right? To, to say that. And then, you know, Dr. Musetti has, has explained what the plan is uh, for the administration. But again, there, there's no there there yet, right? It's just, we, we intended to investigate these things. We really don't have a good plan. We have an idea, but it's not a plan. And it's not something that really, we can vote on at this point, right? We know that the demographic data that the city is using is different from the demographic data that the district is using. There are hidden costs we haven't really taken into account yet. We already know that people are retreating from, from the district just because of the threat of this plan. I mean, it is happening already. It's been kind of brushed off and, and swept under the rug, but it is already happening. So there's a lot of questions that we have out here that we haven't answered. We've got an idea, but not a plan. Um, Really, you know, I mean, with all due respect to Dr. Musetti, she, she could leave at any time, right? She's an employee, but the rest of us aren't. We live here. And if this goes wrong, we are the ones who have to fix it, right? We are the ones who have to fix it, so we've got to get it right. As Kobus said earlier, you know, this is a measure twice and cut once sort of thing. We have to get it right. And so, you know, for the board, I just say, look, think about what a personal threshold for you to vote no to this proposal would be. What would you not want to lose? And understand that's what other people are thinking right now, okay? And whether or not your yes vote is actually required right now. Because as far as I can tell, the district can proceed with its planning while we reevaluate this proposal. So I just encourage the board to think about what is their threshold for a no? And do we actually have to say yes right now? Or can we say, we'll proceed as though we're saying yes, but we'll continue to investigate the problem. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Robbie Gamble Holly. We're not hearing anything, Mr. Reese. You there, Robbie? I am here, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Robin Gamble Holly. Thank you to the task force, Dr. Massetti and the trustees. Although there's a very difficult decision in front of you, I've really come to realize that the board and Dr. Massetti, you guys are trying to do what you believe is best for kids while also being mindful of the district's budget. I have a fifth grader who in order to um, meet his social emotional needs is enrolled in River Middle School for the next academic year. And then I also have a third grader um, who would be a better fit at our neighborhood school, which is Harvest. Um, so with this proposal, my family is being hit on both ends for our options for middle school. Um, I don't want these campuses to close because they are of value to our community. Um, with their proposed uh, closures, 
I feel that the public school options for my children and many others will be eliminated. So I was very, very pleased to hear of the proposal of adding two TK8 campuses to the district. Um, I request that the resolution 21-23 be amended tonight to specifically include having TK8s at Shear and Browns Valley Elementary School in the resolution. And if an amendment cannot be made tonight and resolution 21-23 passes um, as is, I request that the implementation plan presented by Dr. Musetti be formalized and included in the minutes um, for tonight's meeting. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Jolene Yi. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, you are facing mounting overwhelming public opposition to the proposal before you this evening. This opposition includes well-documented data that directly contradicts the data provided by the district in support of the proposal. Understandably, this puts you, the trustees, in a very difficult position. Just a few examples. Several task force members have written publicly that Dr. Massetti failed to answer requests for additional data needed to verify the district's proposals, and you should be concerned that the district was unwilling or unable to provide that requested data. In response to a question by Trustee Dooley at the last board meeting, Dr. Massetti indicated that she did not know how many families leave the district to pursue private school education. Generally speaking, the district CEO should know why and how many customers leave for the competition. But it's alarming that no studies or research was conducted to understand the impact of closing the two middle schools on NVOSD enrollment. An informal survey conducted on the River Middle School community shows that a distressing number of families would leave the district, either by choosing to homeschool, moving to private school, or by leaving Napa altogether if you choose to close River. An even larger number of families would be interested in leaving to attend an independent charter school utilizing the River program and culture. Data regarding the cost of busing resulting from the closure of harvest provided to you and to the public by Lorraine Richardson is alarming. And the demographic information presented by Dr. Massetti to the board last week presents a different picture than data presented to the city council on April 20th. This discrepancy in data needs to be reviewed and considered. If the reason you are closing a school is because you need to save money, then it's imperative when making that decision to understand the full cost impact of that closure. It is very clear from the questions being asked and the answers being given that you do not have all the information necessary to make an informed decision. And the consequences of a wrong decision are dire, not just for the hundreds of Harvest and River families, but for the 17,000 MVUSD students. The 22-23 budget shows a reserve of 3.3%. It would not take much for us to drop below 3%, triggering a state takeover. The district document show an $11.7 million deficit. If our survey is correct and more families leave the district because you close River, then I think a lot more families better be prepared because Dr. Musetti is not done and she is going to have to close a lot more schools to prevent the district from going into receivership. You need to be much more concerned than you have expressed to us in your emails and in conversations about the lack of data and the failure to fully validate the numbers in the proposal provided by Dr. Musetti. You should be very nervous about approving a proposal that is not accompanied by a detailed plan of implementation, including a thorough outline of associated costs. A stake takeover would be devastating for all of us. Your management of the district will be intensely scrutinized. Please postpone the decision for 90 days and take the time to fully vet a comprehensive proposal that won't put our district into receivership. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Mr. Reese. Uh, Melissa Hillman. Hi, my name is Melissa Hillman and I recently moved to Napa in the summer of 2020. I submitted a letter last night to the board that had, that had a detailed review of, of the implications of not evaluating the environmental impacts that will occur as a result of closing harvest and river. And I'd encourage you to read that in detail as there are 
there are issues that need to be fully vetted, not only as we've heard tonight from a number of families on a number of issues from the financial sides of things to the impacts that our children will have emotionally as a result of these closures, but there also will be impacts environmentally that will impact our community. I believe that like a number of people we've heard about, heard from tonight, that this decision to close these middle schools has been incredibly rushed and needs further evaluation. In California, there's an act called the California Environmental Quality Act. In my letter, I put forth a fair argument demonstrating that there's substantial evidence that this project will have a significant adverse effect on the environment due to the increases in transportation, the increases in air quality and greenhouse gas emissions as a result of the transportation. And because a number of our community members have also expressed concerns about these environmental impacts, the district has an obligation to conduct a thorough review to determine if those impacts are significant. And if those environmental impacts are significant, then an environmental impact report would need to be prepared before moving forward on this project. What those with that evaluation would include would be looking at each of the end of in three large individual schools to evaluate, evaluate the number of students that actually walk and the number of students that are driven and which will result in the least impact to the environment. And that should be taken into consideration when determining which school to close. Now, if Napa Valley Unified School District does not do their due diligence and ensure that the impact of this project is not significant, then the school district will be opening themselves up to very costly litigation that will delay any project that would move forward with respect to closing a middle school. So given that fact, it seems that we shouldn't vote on this resolution tonight and we should do the research that's necessary to make sure that we're covering our bases with respect to CEQA. And because of this fact, I encourage the board to either vote against this resolution or delay voting until the proper evaluation has been done. Thank you for your time and good luck with making the right decision. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Good evening. My name is Tony Parise and I was not going to speak this evening because I sent plenty of emails to the board members as well as participated speaking at other meetings. I must speak tonight to tell you that enough is enough. The turmoil is enough. I'm taking a slightly different tack this evening. This is very personal for me. I have a sixth grader at River Middle School. Tonight, I heard Dr. Massetti talk about the SEL program at River in more minutes than she's spoken the entire time of the process for evaluating its closure for River and Harvest. There is no plan there. There's just an idea, as other statements have been made. I think it's shameful the board is considering this bulldozed singular recommendation. The turmoil is enough for my family and my friends will be hit, sad to hear that despite whatever decision you make this evening, I will be removing my child from the district. Whatever decision you make this evening, it's just not worth it for my sixth grader to go through the disaster that will take place over the next several years. You have created a self-fulfilling prophecy even before making the decision because of the lousy way that this process has been handled. As trustees for our children, where are you pushing back, asking questions, asking for more recommendations, more creative recommendations? Why aren't you demanding more? I urge you to vote no, but I'm sorry to say it's too late for my family. We will be leaving the district. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Tracy Moskowitz. Hi, my name is Tracy Moskowitz. I've spoken at, I don't know how many of these now. 
and my comments today are slightly different. Um, I am a teacher at River Middle School. I am a homeowner in American Canyon. I have a daughter, uh, TK, at Pueblo Vista. So I'm I'm all in here. I'm fifth generation Napa, but in short, I feel that there has been nothing but backdoor deals for all of this. I've made these comments fully hoping that I'm using the system appropriately when clearly there was already an answer before there was even public comment, which I wanna point out, there was only public comment. There was never a single time where I got to ask a question and get an answer, which is ridiculous. I, as an employee, do not feel heard. I feel stepped on. As a parent, I don't feel heard. I don't feel that I'm being given information, not just to do with the middle school redesign task force, but the dual immersion program. I had no idea it went to middle school and high school. I signed my daughter up for it, and I had no idea that that even happened. There is lack of communication in all ways. There is lack of transparency, and those are your goals. Your goals are transparency to employees, to the community, and none of that is happening. We're hearing from so many parents from pub or from Browns Valley about a TK through eight, because through rumors, if they spoke up, they get it. That, that is inconceivably wrong to be told by somebody at the district, if you speak up at these meetings, we'll make sure it happens as long as this happens. That's a backdoor deal. So as an employee, I'm a great math teacher, fantastic. And my students are beyond my highest priority, but I'm stepped on as a teacher and that's not okay. Thank you for your comment. Um, if my tally is correct, um, we're at 17 comments. Um, Mr. Reese, can you tell me um, how many more hands are up? We have 11 hands up. Jose Gonzalez Mars. Okay. Um, I know we usually take a time for a break around this, so let's pause here before um, the next um, uh, individuals make their comments. So let's do that. Um, so we're gonna take a five minute break and uh, return to resume public comment. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your patience and letting us Take a bathroom break and stretch our backs. Um, Mr. Ruiz, can you um, let me know how many hands are raised? Uh, we have 13 hands raised, President Gonzalez Montes. Okay. Um, what I'm going to propose is that um, we close it at 13 hands, 13 comments, um, and allowing three minutes for each to comment. And at that point, um, we will close uh, for public comment. Okay. All right, next comment, next speaker, Mr. Reese. Okay, Carl. Yes, thank you, Board of Trustees, Dr. Massetti and the community. Um, I have written letters uh, before, so thank you for taking the time to, to read those uh, trustees. Uh, these comments are based off of the opening remarks of Dr. Musetti and ties into one of my earlier points that there doesn't seem to be due process in making this decision. One is where you're voting for a decision that is going to repurpose a school, River Middle School, but there's no plan of what repurposing means. So how can a board vote on something that has not even been evaluated to how that school is going to be repurposed? And then more directly to the points today uh, about a transition plan or a transition idea that Dr. Massetti laid out. Um, I echo that those could be great ideas, but what is the plan? 
has a financial analysis been done on the plan for the comprehensive work to be done with to transition the students over the um, now the new plan with having kids stay on at river school has how does that affect the budget that's been laid out for the for the savings so that takes away from those potential savings an analysis has not been done further there's an idea about a tk through eight program um, how does that affect the decision to have the dli at river how will that supplant it or replace it and then what happens to river again we have a lot of ideas but no plan about how to move forward in what the school projects or the school board projects as a declining enrollment also it's been said at other times but also in the plan how we're going to make a robust S, uh, sel program at the larger middle schools River has been a school for, I believe, 26 years. Why wasn't this done prior to a motion or a resolution to shut down the school? How can it be said that we are going to do this when we're 26 years in and it really hasn't been done? And if it wanted to be done, why wasn't this done prior, uh, prior to even this motion or resolution be, uh, coming up? And lastly, to reference the, the King study, um, there was two recommendations out of there. And one was to consolidate at least temporarily um, schools. And it, there was a rec recommendation for middle schools. Well, we're not consolidating, we're closing down. We have tried to at least have the 200 kids for the DLI and, on, and then River remain. And there's nothing temporary about this. So the own, the own study and conclusions are not being followed by the study that the school board and, and or district put on. Uh, I urge you to vote no. We do not have a plan. And um, thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Lorena Munoz. Um, hi. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I just want to start by saying a saying um, when they say when the, you hear the river sound, more likely it has water in it. Um, when you hear all these parents worry about their school, either river, or harvest, and everybody, when you hear the four test members complaining about how they were treated, and how they plan everything. They're not uncomfortable. They're really uncomfortable with the decisions. They were not allowed to make decisions to give new scenarios because all the scenarios were given by the district. They were not given by the four tax members. Um, that has to be, that means something for you. That has to be mean something for you guys. You guys had to listen to them because it's impossible that you guys are only listening to one person but not the four task, not the parents, the people that is really being affected by all this. Uh, second of all, um, I just want to say there's no plan. And I think if you guys are looking for an option, why not, like I said before, why not ask for more money to the state? Why that is not an option? Why can I get the parents together and go to the state, the state to Sacramento and ask for an increase of money? For the students why that's not an option i mean if you guys are really looking to our kids and are worried and you guys want to be like you guys want to have a better future for our kids and you want to look after them that's one option because closing schools is not an option because if we keep closing schools we're going to get less money and less money and less money and that's not an option because more kids are leaving the district in that way or if we or if you guys are go by the way, um, saying that we're gonna lose a lot of the students, why cannot we, if we're really losing a lot of students, why can we not be like single in a school district? I mean, they don't have a problem with enrollment. They don't have a problem with the money. Why cannot be like that? It's just wondering. The other option, it was like in the first task, um, some of the options were given, it was close Redwood Middle School. But that was not an option. I think when they said this is an option, 
option, but not really an option, then it's like they're cutting our hands, they're cutting our voices. I think you guys have to pay attention to that. And I think we all support not closing any schools for now, because $2 million is not going to help our students in any way, not even the district, because at the end, you're going to lose more money by closing schools than by not. That's it. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Samantha Holland. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. I have unfortunately been here before as my family was affected by previous school closures. I have to say that it was shocking to me to hear this conversation begin tonight with next steps when you have not even voted on this. What does that tell us? It tells me that the decision has obviously already been made. Adding the K through eight item in the mix that was not recommended or reviewed by in the process and asking for an amendment of that proportion is seriously adverse to good public policy and decision making. This process was flawed and the recommendation and plan presented are seriously underdeveloped. There are lots of ideas being presented, but where is the analysis of the cost and savings of all of this? How does it affect your bottom line? Which is what we're really addressing here. You're making a decision and we're talking about money. You are making a decision to save money. All of these ideas, they come at a cost. What is the, what is the cost of all of that? There are conversations and promises being made outside of the public meeting process they were even discussed tonight in Dr. Musetti's opening comments, and these should not weigh into your decision tonight. A possibility of analyzing to try a K through eight is not a solution to assist those students who thrive in a smaller environment and will be displaced by this closure. If this is the best solution we have to this issue, I am shocked and I am saddened as a parent and as a citizen. I encourage you to vote no. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Norma Ortiz. Can you hear me? Yes. Following my public comment of April 15, 2021 of 1036 PM is as follows. Whichever the decision to date, it will bring change and impact in the lives of many students, families, and the community. We don't want to see the closure of schools. I feel that one town hall meeting in Spanish and another in English to address this highly important matter was simply not enough. NVUSD sending an email the same day of the previous board meeting of April 15 at 11 a.m. to join was not sufficient. I recall the time when NVUSD felt rushed with the pre-litigation of the redistricting matter. And at that time, our now president, Elba Gonzalez Mares said, it was disrespectful to the Latino community. Perhaps some reflection needs to be noted compared to what we are currently facing with the harvest issue, mostly regarding the platform of information, data, communication, civil engagement, and other fundamental and valuable aspects worthy of listening because there was enough time to do so. As a district, we face obstacles that we can overcome, but if we continue to stay united and respect all of our contributions with integrity, we can successfully move forward. In my opinion, demographically speaking, closing harvest is not the best option solution. I feel that the information was not presented in a full transparent manner and that was disappointing. The redesign task force at first with pre-selected scenarios and the district's lack of effort to invest in harvest made everything more than evident the closure of harvest. There was a lot of disagreement within such task force committee in the attempt to make the decision that is expected more so seem official, but that is being opposed, rejected by many families for various reasons. It is well known that the dual immersion pipeline continues at harvest. In my opinion, what will be done in river could have been further implemented and invent, invested at harvest with the current proposal of scenario G instead of neglect. In my opinion, I feel that the district needs to work more on inclusivity, equity, and education and other. We are united, we speak our voices, but we need to start with ourselves, acknowledge the realities that our district is facing with experience and informed decisions, taking into account all the factors, not just some. 
if you can eat, live peacefully, feel pleasant about what you will do and create, and do the right thing directed towards our students, the present and upcoming NVUSC generation, generations, then perhaps you have done the right thing. Students have the right to be bilingual, belligerent, and culturally linguistic, a right to receive quality of instruction to further support, especially those economic social disadvantaged students are harvest ones. It would be a double harmful effect for those students that attend Harvest to see that their school is being closed, where they could have, where they have to, will have to be bus Monday through Friday around town both ways on top of the COVID-19 trauma. How do we move forward with such realities is an important question, but it, it shouldn't be done at the expense of having to close Harvest. And no, Ms. Chu, you are not naive. I have faith that you continue to ask questions on behalf of our community. Education is not a business. Dr. Massetti, you mentioned in our conversation yesterday regarding a possible proposed future bond. It is risky, but I feel the closure of both things. is indeed much more. I'm just Ortiz, finishing my you. comment. Thank you for your comment. In Ms. many Ortiz. different. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, S. Green. Yes, good evening. I, I would like to raise an American Canyon voice. We have the largest comprehensive middle school in the county. It provides an excellent education to its students, to our students, to our kids. And we have a stake in district solvency as decisions made about schools in Napa City have an effect on kids in American Canyon. I am in support of the proposal because fiscal solvency is imperative to retain our kids' excellent education. I'm also disappointed with the tone of some comments tonight. There were multiple and transparent meetings leading to the recommendation. Deliberations were no surprise. Hints of legal action strike me as counterproductive. Unless those objecting to the proposal can deliver funding through bonds and parcel taxes that eliminate the difference between what the state provides and what is desired, then we must all recognize that we have to live within a budget even if that means we are disappointed. Just like we in the AC were when we couldn't get another middle school and ours is very, very full to the gills. It's also important to remind ourselves again that had $35 million been spent on Harvest, Redwood and Silverado instead of Salvador, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So we're stuck. There just aren't enough students for all the campuses. So which one's going to close? In the ACA, as I said, we were disappointed for the same demographic reasons. We had to realize that excellent programming needs to be available to all of our children. And that is way more important than bricks and mortar. So I can only encourage everyone, please come together as a community and work together as a community to make the best of what we have right now and and take ourselves and put ourselves in the position of our kids and say what do i want for them when it comes to programming and let's let's focus on the programming being available to all our children across all the schools thank you thank you for your comment next speaker mr reese Yes, Marissa Roars. Hello. Um, I, this is the first time that I've spoken up and I know that this is a really difficult decision for, for all of us. And I went to River School when it was still on um, South Children, both go to NBLA. And I must admit that the idea of them being in a brand new school um, that is wall to wall middle school um, DI is appealing and exciting. Um, however, I do, <laughs> I do have to say that I was very shocked and, and surprised hearing about um, Browns Valley, you know, offering up this proposition of, well, we'll just become a K-8 when NBLA has been trying to become K-8 for years. Um, most of us really as parents there rally for a K-8 um, at NBLA. So I'm just confused as to why this is even being brought up um, as an option, but it's not an option for NBLA. Um, you know, there's a lot of weird equality things happening here. 
I also think it's a shame to close River at the same time. Um, it's a unique program and it's small and it's needed. And, you know, if we want to draw families in, if we want people to come here for education, then we can't have schools that all look exactly the same. We can't have schools that the programs are all exactly the same. One size doesn't fit all. And if it's all the same, then people are going to leave. And you know, the other reason people are going to leave, people are going to leave because they're scared that every single year, more schools are going to close. That's why people are one of the reasons that people are leaving because it's unstable. Now you have to have an exit plan. You have to, you know, live within your budget as the previous speakers have mentioned, but there needs to be so much more creativity here and, you know, acknowledgement of these special programs and not false promises of, well, we're going to make this better. Oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that because it hasn't been done. It's not going to be. And if it is, it's all going to look exactly the same. It's just really disappointing. So while there are pros and there are cons and the decisions seem to almost already have been made, I just, I think it's really devastating for our community and it's going to continue to be because this isn't going to be the last closure that happens. Elementary schools will be back on the docket and middle schools too. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Danielle M. Good evening. Numbers can tell stories from any presenter's perspective because that's what you can do with data, manipulate it to tell your story. At the task force and during the board meetings, raw numbers of students were given in many cases. And the problem with raw numbers is that it gives no context for its relationship to the whole. I want to ensure you realize this scenario will impact every community, each an integral piece of the larger Napa community. The choice to close the Harvest Campus, Harvest Program, and River Program is the largest disruption to our community out of all the scenarios presented at the task force. There are three big questions I want you to consider. Is a middle school language academy really the best choice? How many dual immersion elementary families were surveyed to actually determine the academy's viability? Zero. How many dual immersion teachers were surveyed to determine the academy's viability? Zero. How many prior dual immersion parents who did not continue in middle school were surveyed to find out the reason why? Zero. A proposed middle school language academy sounds appealing. However, enrollment numbers in the dual immersion elementary schools are not large enough to fill the potential new language academy site. Dr. Musetti originally stated the large kindergarten cohort is a driving factor that will eventually fill the language academy to be wall to wall, but how can those students be guaranteed to enroll at the middle school language academy? I wanted to find out, so I conducted a survey of, of 20 dual immersion kindergarten families. Only two said they would absolutely go to the dual immersion or language academy. Six said they possibly would, seven said they would not, and five did not respond. For those families who said they maybe or no, their reasoning was as follows. Proximity to home, electives, fluency by fifth grade, extracurricular commitments, and lack of environmental change from elementary. Granted, this is a small sample size, but if there is little demand for actually having a standalone language academy, what's the point of opening one? Why were dual immersion families not even spoken to when developing this idea? The next question is, what was the task force recommendation? The middle school redesign task force was made up of roughly 50 people. In the board meeting agenda for tonight, it says that the task force approved the final recommendation of scenario G, but the entire task force did not approve this recommendation, nor did any of them improve it as it was presented and has even morphed into tonight's remarks. Even those groups that said there was a consensus for G actually wondered if it could be a different mood of school other than Harvest, had questions, stipulations, and reservations. Three people voted to close River, one abstained entirely, one voted for River, one Harvest, one voted not River, and two people stated it would be detri detrimental to the Harvest community. Again, why was the K-8 at Shearer just added on to tonight's idea? Does this have to do with the Latinx community? 
The affluent white technology able Browns Valley parents have spoken up that they want a K-8, but all of a sudden you. tonight, Shearer is adding to the idea. Comment. I urge you to look at. Thank you for your comments, Daniel. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. William C. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, hi, I'm a parent of a Browns Valley kindergartner who is obviously new to the district being a kindergartner. Um, and so far, you know, obviously COVID has changed a lot as far as the schooling system and everything else like that, um, as well as the district budgets and just the future and outlook of the whole district. Um, as being a business owner, I completely understand having a, uh, you know, positive profit and loss sheet and everything else like that. Um, you know, living within your means, all that kind of stuff, as well as making sure we have a future for Napa that is um, bright and good for everybody. Um, I myself, you know, grew up in Napa. I went through a K through eighth kind of system. It was a private school, um, but that's kind of where my background is. Um, for my daughter, I want, you know, the best for her education. You know, looking at Napa's schooling, um, initially you know thinking of where she would go you know she probably would have gone the browns valley river school kind of track um knowing that the school district is you know having to make some tough decisions and uh find ways to keep things afloat um you know being able to keep those smaller class sizes if possible sounds appealing um being able to assist in uh, lessening any sort of overcrowding at any of the other middle schools uh, with any potential school closures. Um, you know, Browns Valley has a pretty large campus with um, extra classrooms. Um, they have a principal that is, I think, the right leader in place to potentially take on that task. Um, I think being able to pilot a K through eighth at Browns Valley sounds great. I'm so happy to hear that, you know, they're looking to roll that out to other elementary schools. Um, I think that's the right move to look at the schools that are currently going into harvest or really any other school that's being um, looking at any sort of closure and somehow seeing the school campus, seeing the facilities, seeing if there's a way to get those elementary schools that are going into a current middle school and seeing if they can be turned into a K through eighth, um, be it space or staffing and what have you. Um, that way those students can remain in their schools, still have a positive middle school experience um, and not have to, you know, worry so much about the shuffle that's going on right now. I'm happy to hear that, you know, there is a plan in place to keep the current uh, students that are currently enrolled to these middle schools um, and keeping them there at least uh, through the remainder of their time. And then obviously any other new students, uh, they'll have some options on their plate of where they can go or uh, potentially, you know, in the case for my daughter, uh, hopefully a K through eighth in the future. Um, I really appreciate all that you're doing. I know it's been you know, several months of planning and lots of these meetings, but um, I wish you guys luck. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Aisha. Yes. Hi. Uh, good evening. And thank you for letting me make a comment. I am an ex-River board member. Let me tell you, River School is a unique place who sees value in its students and making them leaders for tomorrow. And my son and daughter, they both went to River School and my son, he taught coding there, programming there for three years because his teachers and principals saw that talent in him. And like my son, there were, uh, there were so many other students who were able to show their talent and all these teachers and principal were so encouraging to these kids. So uh, because it's a smaller school, so all of the school staff, teachers, principal, they know their kids' uh, uh, positives, uh, their strengths and weakness, and they are always working with the kids to improve their strengths and uh, weakness. So uh, the thing is, and um, so the thing is, sorry, uh, um, and NVST, uh, I live in American Canyon and NVUST was supposed to build a second middle school in American Canyon, which they canceled. So not all parents can afford to send their kids to private schools. So it's our right to have alternate options where we can send our schools to smaller school settings. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. 
Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Gina Griggs. Hi, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Musetti, board members and trustees. Um, thank you for sticking in there, listening to all of our comments, um, taking everything into consideration. This is not an easy thing to have to have in front of us. It's not an easy problem to solve. Um, I want to start by saying that I was a part of the middle school redesign task force. Um, there was a process that we went through and I appreciated that process. I'm also a parent of a River School alum. She is 21 now and a parent of a sixth grader at River School. I believe in the program and so many great things have been said about the program that I don't need to repeat them. What I'd like to talk about is numbers. Uh, numbers and enrollment is the reason that we're here, the reason that we're in this difficult position because we do have to be fiscally solvent. So there are currently 685 enrolled students at Harvest. 291 students are currently in the dual language immersion program, sixth through eighth. The river campus capacity is 630. There are currently 469 students at the River School campus, 172 of those sixth graders, 167 seventh graders and 130 eighth graders, showing growth in the grades since they've moved to the new campus with higher capacity. This proposal is contingent upon doubling our current DLI numbers and mitigating the matriculation out of the DLI program in the middle school years to fill the River School campus. The river, the DLI program numbers in the middle school would literally have to double to fill the river school campus. However, currently river school is projected to increase in enrollment if left as river school, taking it to 82% at 514 students. This needs to be considered because enrollment is the reason that we're here. DLI might do better with a wall-to-wall, -wall, but it currently does not have a wall-to-wall. -wall. There's a strand at Napa High and there could be a strand at Redwood or Silverado. River is a sought after program, which encourages enrollment and keeps kids in our district. It is important to keep students in the district. That's why we're here. This decision is also not equitable because it is stating loud and clear that the DLI program is more valuable than the SLE program. That's not okay and it's not equitable. It's not fiscally sound because it's not utilizing a brand new campus to capacity. It's not responsible facility management because the district just spent 35 million on the new river campus and it does not support program excellence. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. Yes, Claire Silver. Hello, I'm actually Nicole. I'm speaking from my mom's computer. Uh, I'm a seventh grader at River and you might remember the emails I sent to you. I now would like to respond to what you said back to me so that you can hear me. I live in the middle school community. I think that we're moving too fast. I care a lot about this, this, the decision that you're making because it affects my life, my peers' life and my family for multiple years. If I didn't care, I would say nothing, but I'm scared to death right now. In the long run, creating a K through eight at Browns Valley and Shearer seems to separate and segregate us more. If I, as a seventh grader, can understand the faults in these plans, then you should be able to be able to too. I hope you vote no. I know you'll vote yes, but I still think you should reconsider. And I urge you not to disgrace your our neighborhood with hasty and bad decisions. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker, Mr. Reese. That was our 13th speaker, President Gonzalez Matos. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reese. Um, we are now closing public comment on this item. Um, I will now ask um, for board comment and uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Um, with Trustee Gracia. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to start by commending the hard work put in by all the folks on the task force. 
they did the difficult work of analyzing over 11 scenarios, weighing each one against a set of four important criteria, and ultimately recommending a single scenario to the board. The recommendation was near unanimous from the task force. The task force represented a cross section of the community and had invested parents from all of the middle schools in Napa. I cannot thank them enough for all the hard work that they put in. I do feel it's necessary to rehash how we arrived at this point. There are two main pieces driving the decision we are being asked to make here today. The first is finances. If you look back at second interim, you can see in year three, which is the 22-23 school year, that our current reserve is slated to plummet back to the minimum required by the state of California. <clears throat> The travesty is that the 22-23 budget already includes the cost savings of closing a middle school campus. Thus, even with the shuttering of a middle school already accounted for, we are just barely able to keep our reserves above the minimum necessary to avoid state receivership. We may also need to consider the closure of another small elementary school in order to increase the cost savings for the 22-23 school year. The financial situation of the district is dire. When staff presented second interim in March, my fellow trustees and I expressed our dissatisfaction with the proposed deficit spending in year two, which is the upcoming 21-22 school year. Even now, staff is hard at work attempting to find places to make stronger cuts to the 21-22 budget to avoid deficit spending and the catastrophic results currently projected in budget year three. These cuts continue to be hard to come by, but are necessary to preserve the financial health of the district. Staff will succeed in shoring up the 21-22 budget by the time we reach budget adoption in June, but they cannot deliver enough cuts to prevent year three from continuing to be a very serious problem. The second issue that has brought this decision before us today is declining enrollment. The population inside the district has been declining for the last 10 years and is expected to continue to decline for at least the next seven years. We have already lost 1,300 students in the district from our highest peak and are on pace to lose several thousand more, dropping to approximately 14,000 students by the 27-28 school year. At present, we have already have 1,500 empty seats at the middle school level. And with declining enrollment, the number of empty seats is only gonna continue to grow, reaching over 2,000 empty seats by the 27-28 school year. Despite what will end up being nearly two decades of declining enrollment, previous administrations decided to continue to build new schools and new facilities. Despite the declining enrollment, the district under previous leadership chose to build a new middle school campus on the Old Salvador site. The Old Salvador site is not a large site and can only accommodate a small middle school in the space available. Building this campus was a mistake. We would have been far better served by shuttering the Salvador campus and using the money to make our other district campuses warm, safe, and dry. Unfortunately, that money was spent and cannot be gotten back. Due to the actions of previous administrations, we are stuck with an out of place, small middle school campus that is in pristine shape. The buildings are all brand new and look amazing. At the end of the day, we cannot afford to keep this campus empty. Thus, the question has become, what is the best use for this campus? We have heard from many at the Harvest Campus about how their middle school has unique programming that is worth preserving. Harvest was home to both the IB and DLI middle school programs in the district. The community members who have fought to preserve those programs are correct in asserting that they are both valuable and important. Those programs are very much worth preserving. Thus, any solution that includes the closure of harvest must include a discussion of what happens to those programs. 
the choice about what to do with the Salvador campus isn't particularly difficult once you realize that there is only a single program that we have in our entire district that covers students from kindergarten through 12th grade. We have heard multiple times during task force deliberations that parents want pathways and that pathways are important to them. Here, we have an opportunity to strengthen the only pathway currently available in K-12 in the district and really give it a dedicated opportunity to flourish. By placing the DLI program on the Salvador campus, we have a way to facilitate the continuation of this pathway that is highly valued in our community. Having a dedicated middle school campus will only strengthen the DLI program throughout the district. Knowing how much demand there is for educational pathways that cover K-12, we need to explore the opportunity to bring more pathways to the district. I believe we need to look to the IB program for our second district pathway. IB was a second partial pathway we had in the district. Like the DLI program, it had some weaknesses and needs strengthening. By removing Harvest from the mix, we have foreclosed a pre-existing partial IB pathway. Rather than eliminate such a path, I would see us strengthen it by converting a remaining middle school to the IB program. The ultimate end goal would be to offer a full K-12 pathway for IB, which would eventually necessitate an IB high school as well. I see space in the district for a strong elementary through high school IB pathway. In addition to the IB and DLI paths, I anticipate we one day could also develop a third path, STEAM. To the river folks, I am sorry that you are being forced to give up your program. It feels like we had only just welcomed you back into the district and established you at that shiny new campus. I understand it feels terrible to finally have gotten everything you wanted only to have it taken away. Your program, however, is a one-off in the district and has no other pathway integration at either elementary or high school. Unfortunately, in this instance, your program must yield to the only K-12 pathway that exists in the district, as we must maintain that pathway for the students who are already invested in the 13-year DLI experience. A few short years ago, I was excited to welcome you back into the district. So it is with a heavy heart that I must now support the pulling of your program. While I know it is slim consolation, the district has committed to implementing some of the social emotional overlay developed at River into the other middle schools. To the to those who call us out as ignoring the disadvantaged youth attending Harvest, the numbers do not back up your claims. The fact is all three of our large middle schools in the city of Napa have similar numbers of disadvantaged youth. All three have similar numbers of Latinx youth. All three have similar numbers of English language learners. Where they are not the same, however, is all three do not have a high percentage of students who attend in the boundary area. A significantly higher portion of Harvest students don't reside in the boundary area of the school. More Harvest parents and students are already traveling to attend Harvest than either of the other two middle schools in our district. Harvest also has the smallest student population of the three large middle schools and thus would impact the least number of students in its closure. Harvest is also the school with the least equitable facilities and the most in need of repair and improvements. From a financial perspective, it also makes the most sense to close Harvest. As I pondered this decision, I kept returning to the words of Mike Wilmarth on 41521. He said, and I quote, middle schools, unlike elementary schools, are not designed to be neighborhood schools, and this is a strength. Middle schools bring together students from a number of different neighborhoods. Mike is right. Middle schools are a combination of multiple neighborhood schools. They are designed to expand students' horizons through exposure to the broader student community. The opportunity for students to mingle with peers from all over the city on a single campus is an important component in their social development. 
For all the foregoing reasons, I will be supporting the task force recommendation to adopt option G. I want to take careful note of the additional recommendations provided by the task force after settling on option G, specifically the emphasis that was put on communication. Task force members stressed that we as a district need to do an exceptional job in communicating this decision and the impacts therefrom to the community. The task force asked that our communications be robust and thorough. I want to make sure we give extra attention to communicating the closure and subsequent open enrollment process out to our families. We must strive to ensure that current families gets lots of information about the various options and supports that will be made available to them. We must be very transparent in communicating everything from transportation options to after school care. Clear and frequent communication will ensure parents understand their options and that students can successfully attend their new schools. While the communication that the task force was concerned about was parent communication, that is not the only communication that I am concerned about. I would like to see us do a much better job of communicating with our staff around this process. Staff needs to hear more often from the district and be better supported than they were the last time the district did school closure. I expect it will be a little bit easier this time, just from the simple fact that staff will not be forced to move during a pandemic. That doesn't mean moving around this many staff members isn't going to be difficult because it will be difficult. Moving many years of accumulated material to a new school site is not easy. All staff will go through a period of adjustment at their new location and will need additional time and support to integrate with their new learning community. I see this as an opportunity for growth for NVUSD after having observed our last school closure process. I don't like having to close schools, but the financial pressures cannot be remedied without school closure. Since I have been on the board, we have had to take repeated urgent action in order to maintain the district's fiscal solvency. And unfortunately, that includes having to close another school tonight. The decision-making process of closing and redesigning middle schools is complex, emotional, and arduous. The process necessitated stakeholder input and it inspired activism. I want to say thank you to the task force for your time and commitment to positive outcomes for our students. Thank you to all who advocated on behalf of their children in the belief that their education is worth fighting for. Thank you to Dr. Massetti and staff for supporting community input and for providing forums for voices to be heard. I have read every <clears throat> email received, including submitted public comment. I have received emails from parents, students, and community members affiliated with all four schools, as well as elementary schools. The representation in public comment and the special board meeting were focused on Harvest and River School, but I want to acknowledge the magnitude of advocacy on behalf of Redwood, Silverado, and BLA, Browns Valley, and Pueblo Vista. The purpose of the task force and community input has been to determine the best path forward. What is the best way to address declining enrollment, operating too many middle schools, and the maximization of district resources for our students? One of the stated goals of the task force was to improve instructional programming for all middle school students. I acknowledge the extreme difficulty placed on task force members not allowing personal bias, emotion, or adjunct issues to clout to cloud the decision making process. Why are we here? We are here to discuss the privileges that will be lost for our students if we do not make fiscally prudent decisions. We will not have the privilege of discussing educational options, the privilege of implementing programmatic enhancements, or the privilege of school choice if we are in state receivership. The conversation around school closure is taking place because we as a district are committed to providing the highest quality education we can given our budget constraints. The framework includes the realities of our financial situation, declining enrollment as you have heard, underutilized facilities, underfunded pensions, low cash reserves, and yes, the need to close schools. Purpose and change are not always considered congruent, but purposeful work is about improvement and embedded in that work is change. 
This process comes with expectations, without which we will retain the status quo. And in order to break that stalemate, we must integrate the two. Our purpose is to provide a clear and shared vision for conducive learning environments at all schools. The strategy is to execute on quality programming enhancements and social emotional support for the holistic well being of our students. Implementation can only be generated by committing financial resources to a project. For families, making difficult decisions that include change requires confronting some unknowns, such as a new campus or a larger campus. This change can create apprehension. The work ahead is to understand the needs of our students so that we can ensure that our students' needs are met. By meeting our students' needs, we will should be able to lessen, if not eliminate, the apprehension caused by this change. The district needs to implement strategies to buffer the impact of declining enrollment. Continued decline will result in significant decreases in state funding, which reinforces the need to downsize. If we delay action, as many of you have requested, we add financial strain to an already fragile system. In order to deliver program upgrades, we need to approach this school closure decision from a perspective of fiscal prudence. We need to close a middle, a middle school and assess site efficiency. Operating fewer schools is the appropriate response to a projected seven year declining trajectory. Despite second interim, including a school closure for budget year 2022-23, we still show an operating deficit. Our cash reserve projection three years out is approximately 3.4%, barely above the state minimum. Declining enrollment trends have us losing approximately 330 students on average for the next seven years. At $10,000 per child, that is approximately 3.3 million per year. I would argue that our cost savings is still much too short of where we need to be. And I would task Dr. Musetti with analyzing capacity and enrollment projections at the elementary level. Nobody enjoys this work, but two issues motivate my request. First, if in receivership, we lose control of the district, there is no superintendent, just a provided administrator that comes in and takes over. What happens to your child's education then? And secondly, even though we would be in financial distress, it is expensive. The state is forced to keep the district solvent through the use of a state loan, which must be repaid with interest, meaning cuts under state receivership would have to be even deeper in order to afford the loan payment in addition to covering normal operations. I would like to clarify a few statements that were on repeat in emails received and at the mic. It is important that we work with accurate information. Correction, the 2.2 is a mere 1.2% 1 1 of the budget. That calculation is skewed. 85% of our budget is spent on salaries and benefits. 15% remains to address the rest of the budget's priorities and needs. 1.2% of the overall budget is significant when the reserve is down to 3.4%. If the 1.2 cost savings is not realized, then our reserves would dip to the 2.1%, which is below the state mandated minimum of 3%. Correction. The elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund and learning loss mitigation funding both have timelines and restrictions on use of those funds. This is one time money and cannot be used to address our structural budget deficit. Correction. Each year we submit to the County Office of Education at least five finance documents for review that are then submitted to the state superintendent of public instruction. These documents include the July 1st preliminary budget, first and second interim reports, an unaudited financial at the end of the budget year, and then the district's annual audit. The interrelationship of spending, student need, complex laws, and regulations intersect to determine how we approach the budget. The budget reflects how we serve our 16,797 students. To preserve and enhance programs, the budget deficit has to be addressed. We must structure capital costs effectively the baseline of safe, warm, and dry has been established, but to understand true facilities impact, you have to assess the baseline, intermediate, and long-term needs, and we have to include, include programmatic equity from a facilities lens. Correction. Ed code limits how proceeds from a school district's sale of surplus property can be expended, generally restricting the expenditure to capital outlay purposes. These funds cannot be used to address structural budget deficits. 
Equity is making sure every student has, support, has the support they need to be successful and an equal chance for success. We look at it from both a systems perspective, which is what we are doing through this process, and the student perspective, which is the benefit of additional quality programming. This addresses outcomes, resources, funding, and support. Achieving equity is dependent on understanding the needs of the student population, designing educational opportunities to meet those needs, and having the support and scaffolding they need to optimize success. We are not ignoring the needs of students with socioeconomic challenges. We are working to provide high quality programming because education is intertwined with equity. Many of our families in socioeconomically challenged areas are already leveraging choice. That choice might be motivated by employment, convenience, or educational preference. Our job as a school district is to recognize that change, that change in demographic and to identify that public perception might be working under a false paradigm. Under our current open enrollment policy, school migration is the right of any family and their actions should speak as loudly as somebody else's words. I have not heard any comments about the correlation between declining enrollment and low income affordable housing. The external factors that contribute to the difficult decisions that are being made this evening demand a conversation. Is anyone speaking about the potential gentrification of the impacted neighborhoods? The average value of a home in Napa went up 13.6% to $780,000 in February of this year, according to an article in the Chronicle. Housing costs are the most likely culprit to drive the move of households out of neighborhoods. The economic reverberations are just starting to echo. The solution of closing a middle school and repurposing river requires us to consider how previous administrations scaled innovation from the margin to the center. Under the current administration, the district is undertaking a transformation of our middle school system. We seek to implement a holistic approach to support and sustain innovations that address academic achievement, social and emotional learning and well being, and the interconnectedness that provides all young people with the skills to build a future. An enriched middle school system can and will emerge. The social emotional learning approach will be a component in the re-engagement and reacclimation to in-person learning environments and will help children connect with themselves and their peers. We all want our children to navigate their world with social emotional, emotional competence and experience, experience moments of mindfulness throughout their school day. The development of self-confidence, empathy and self-worth should be experienced by every child and not be defined by the school they attend but by the mere fact they attend an NBUSD school. SEL is not a programmatic element of a K-12 pathway. And while I agree it is a needed curricular overlay, a dedicated facility is not critical to its implementation. We need to strengthen our only K-12 pathway in this district, and this site provides us the opportunity to do so. The district has been investing in dual immersion in different iterations for over 15 years. This is the latest extension and in incremental rollout of what has been a work in progress for well over a decade. The introduction of a wall-to-wall -wall language academy might <clears throat> be new, but the concept is not. This program will reflect the world around us. The full language comprehension does not happen without exposure to culture. Intercultural competence, developing fluent bilingualism gives children a variety of cultural, cognitive, and economic advantages. This is a dedicated pathway and it requires program dedication to, to achieve the status of exemplary practice. Having a wall-to-wall -wall program will allow the academy to have systems in place to ensure alignment as the program evolves. It is the district's belief that one of the root causes of decline in matriculation from elementary to middle is due to the strand approach. It is programmatically reasonable to focus on a dedicated program as opposed to offering a dedicated school to a philosophy that can be absorbed at another campus. We no longer have true neighborhood schools. Declining enrollment has created availability. Open enrollment has allowed for choice. Despite open enrollment, Harvest is the smallest of the three middle schools. It has the least number of children in its attendance area and has capacity for 1,500 students with a 45.65% occupancy rate. Capacity has a direct impact on financial efficiency. There are 667 students that attend Harvest. 
only 467 of the 684 that live in Boundary chose to attend, which means 200 choose to attend a school out of Boundary. Families are leveraging choice, including the Latinx community. Of the 467 in Boundary students, 375, 80% are Latinx, 82, 18% are white, and nine, 2% are other. Of the 200 students that leave Harvest to attend other schools, 182, 83% are Latinx, 31, 14% are white, and seven, 3% are other. Silverado has the highest socioeconomically disadvantaged count at 498, Redwood at 449, Harvest at 435. All of our schools have children from marginalized communities. This decision is not driven by socioeconomics. I understand that if we analyze these numbers as a percent of population, they would look different, but we have been asked to take action that impacts the smallest number of students. So raw numbers are important to my analysis while percentages are less so. My decision tonight is not based on one set of statistics, but on the examination of the aforementioned and following data. Redwood with 534 Latinx, Harvest 525 and Silverado 502, the numbers are very comparable. Harvest has many children that walk across the street, but we have many students, numbers that I cannot quantify, whom attend the other two comprehensive middle schools and also walk to school. While the proximity might be different, students continue to walk to all of our middle schools. I mention this out of respect for the great number of families that contacted me with this rebuttal. We would have to bus 738 kids if we closed Redwood. 91% of Redwood is in Boundary. We would have to bus 485 kids if we closed Harvest. 71% of Harvest is in Boundary. I know this is a much maligned point of discussion, but I do believe the facilities intermediate and long-term programmatic needs at Harvest must be considered. The reality is we have economically marginalized neighborhoods within every school boundary with different concentrations of economic disparity. The standard measurement metric to determine the socioeconomic status of our student population is the percentage of students receiving free and reduced lunch. It is a proxy measure for the percentage of children living in poverty. We have high poverty areas attached to the majority of our schools, an issue our city has yet to resolve and the school district cannot control. Free and reduced is the education de facto measure of students at risk, and it is a predictive component in the socioeconomic decisions that impact our district. That consistency is woven throughout our system, and we cannot arbitrarily change the tool we use to determine statistically relevant data. We have an aspiration and a responsibility to create, establish and sustain programmatic improvement for our middle school students. We as a district have a decision to make. Should we ignore our fiscal responsibility and keep the status quo? Or should we make tough decisions allowing us to provide transformational programming, support the emotional well-being of our students, provide a positive school climate and develop program options that are not intentionally designed for a narrow segment of the population, but reflect the community that we live and learn in. This is purposeful work and it must be sustainable and it must be scalable. Our job is to make the most thoughtful decision possible within a very specific set of constraints. For the reasons that I have outlined, I will approve the middle school task force recommendation of scenario G. With this decision comes responsibility. We must take care with this transition. We must have conscious property disposition. We must provide support. We must communicate to our families. We must be present in this process. And we will. Thank you, Trustee Jacolex. Um, Trustee Reiser. To begin tonight, I just want to thank Dr. Massetti and her staff, my fellow trustees, the members of the Middle School Redesign Task Force, and every community member who's taken the time to share their opinions and their passion about the choice that we're facing. We are all in this together, working hard, thinking hard, 
striving to do what is best for the students in our district. It's not easy and it's not for the faint of heart. I've tried and failed to keep my comments brief, but please bear with me. This is such a complicated proposal and I tried to structure my comments around the questions and opinions that I've heard directly from stakeholders as well as in the public space. Um, first of all, I've heard a lot of comments about how Dr. Massetti is quote, just looking out for her job. This is her job, exactly this. Dr. Massetti was hired by the previous school board to right the ship. She inherited challenging conditions and had more piled on, including wildfires and a global pandemic. Our previous superintendent and his team ignored the clear data about declining enrollment. And rather than tightening the budget, they unwisely spent down our reserves until we were on the brink of a state takeover. Enrollment statewide has been declining for years, and yet the previous leadership did a grave disservice to our schools by planning and spending as if this were not actually happening. Pivoting away from difficult, unpopular decisions may feel better in the moment, and it may get voters to support you, but it's not fulfilling our obligation as a governance team. I've also heard a repeated message that the district has broken its trust with the community. I actually agree that the district broke trust with the community, but with actions taken before Dr. Massetti's work here began and before any of the current governance team sat on this board. Wittingly or unwittingly, the previous administration overpromised and underdelivered on Measure H by using a master list of those maintenance and modernization projects they determined that school sites needed as if it represented an encompassing list of the projects the district would be able to accomplish if Measure H passed. These actions by the previous administration left the community feeling disappointed resentful and mistrustful of the way NVUSD allocates our resources and manages our funds. Inheriting a trail of broken promises from your predecessor is not exactly what you'd hope for when you're already trying to tackle the fiscal mess they left behind. But this is what our current superintendent and her team has faced with grace, clarity and transparency. This is also the landscape this current board of trustees has inherited. I wanna quickly address some baffling comments I've seen in the public space about welcoming state conservatorship as a way to quote, straighten things out. I taught in Vallejo City Unified School District when that district went bankrupt and was taken over by the state. A state appointed conservator will only concern him or herself with cost savings, not the nuances of community impact, not the strengthening of our programs, just the bottom line. For anyone who thinks entering receivership is a positive solution or a way to hold Dr. Massetti or our board accountable, it's just absurd. Another point that has been repeated in emails and conversations and public comment is that the governance team and the district leadership staff don't seem to really care about equity. And I disagree wholeheartedly. Talk is cheap, but this team walks the walk. We see it in their professional experience. We see it in the decision to work with Promise 54 to examine our organizational practices and center diversity, equity, and inclusion in their work. We see it in the long overdue focus on grading and looking at grading through an equity lens. We see it in our new partnership with West Ed, a leading education nonprofit research center, which is meant to help us in closing the unacceptable achievement gap between our English learners and our native English speakers in the district. 
This achievement gap is not new, but it has not been broadly addressed across the K-12 grade span until Dr. Massetti and her team sought to evaluate our curriculum and services for all of our English learners. And for those who would accuse the district of turning their backs on the most vulnerable of our children, please consider the incredible number of free meals our district has distributed to students and their families during the pandemic. I could go on, but these are just a few examples that speak to this district's commitment to equity and to supporting our traditionally marginalized student populations. I've also heard a lot of commentary about how the Board of Trustees is just here to rubber stamp the district proposal without question. I take my oversight role as a member of this governance team very seriously. And though I'm relatively new to this work and to this team, I'm confident that my fellow trustees have undertaken this decision with diligence and a heartfelt commitment to best serving our students. I have read every email and public comment on this topic and personally responded to as many as I could. I've met with more than a dozen stakeholders in person for an hour or two at a time on Zoom or on the phone and listened with an open mind to their concerns. I have interrogated the proposed scenario in private conversations with Dr. Massetti and her staff. I am not here to rubber stamp without questioning and neither are my fellow trustees. There's been a lot of pushback about uh, members, uh, community members saying that the middle school redesign task force was flawed. Last October as a district parent and neighborhood resident, I was taken aback by the sudden recommendation to close Harvest Middle School. And I supported the decision made by the governance team at that time to press pause. The district recalibrated and approached the necessary step of closing at least one comprehensive middle school again, involving a large number of community stakeholders to study the matter closely and make a recommendation, offering numerous opportunities for public input. In other words, as several commenters tonight have recommended, the district is measuring twice and cutting once. It's an understandable response to attack the process if you do not reach the outcome you hope for, especially when there is such painful loss around the outcome. And while I do think the process could have been structured in a way that allowed for a more free flowing exchange of ideas, there were many limiting factors, including the public health considerations, the constraints of meeting virtually, and respecting the time demand on our task force volunteers. I completely reject the notion that there has been unethical distortion of data to achieve a certain end or that anyone here has an agenda beyond making the best possible choice in a difficult situation. While some in the community are lobbying for more time, Delaying this decision will not change the programmatic, demographic, or financial landscape of this puzzle that we have all been charged to solve. And although there was a handful of vocal dissenters on the task force, the truth is that the majority of task force members found the proposal we're considering tonight to be the best way forward out of a difficult situation. There has been a lot of pushback from the Harvest community saying, if you have to cl close a large middle school, it shouldn't be Harvest. We've heard the rationale the district has presented. We've heard the pushback from affected stakeholders. And for many reasons, the number of students residing in each school boundary area, the number of unduplicated pupils, which is the umbrella term we use to represent economically disadvantaged students, English learners, and foster and homeless youth that are served by each school, the enrollment trends for each area, the current conditions of each facility, the work required to bring them each up to minimum required standard of warm, safe and dry, and the actual number of students impacted by the closure, 
I have come to the conclusion that given that we must close one of our large middle schools, since we have 1,500 empty seats right now in our middle schools, that the site that we must choose is harvest. There has been a lot of really wrenching testimony and comments saying that we can't inflict this irreparable harm to the vulnerable community around the Harvest Middle School. As I've mentioned many times, I came to this seat as a public school educator with years of experiencing serving, experience serving economically disadvantaged students and, our, and English language learners. And I have lived the reality that our society has increasingly leaned on our teachers and our schools to fill needs well beyond the complex and challenging work of educating children. Teachers are social workers, counselors, school nurses, advocates for support services, cheerleaders, confidants, parental figures, fundraisers. Many community members have shared real concerns about neighborhood blight that will threaten the safety of the area or its opposite, gentrification that will further squeeze out our vulnerable community members. I cannot discount the sadness and pain that this closure will bring to residents in this area but it's unfair and unrealistic to ask our schools to be responsible for the health of a neighborhood. NVUSD, like most of the state of California is facing declining enrollment, compounding the difficulty of our dismal per pupil spending rate in the state. It's not that I'm not concerned about this neighborhood. I absolutely am, but concerns about the health of our neighborhoods must be addressed by our local government. Schools just can't shoulder that burden or let it dominate their decision-making. Our obligation is to focus on our mission of delivering the highest quality education to all of our students. This doesn't mean that our school district doesn't have a role to play. And I've had multiple discussions with Dr. Massetti about the role the district can play in supporting the neighborhood of Southwest Napa if the closure of harvest proceeds. She has committed to engaging in a community conscious property disposition, which includes securing the property's safety for the interim period while keeping this transition time as short as possible. It also includes a goal, an attainable goal of supporting a community use space at the former harvest site, whether through a partnership with the city of Napa, local nonprofits, a public private partnership that drives the choice of potential developer or some combination of the three. To that end, I met this week with Councilwoman Beth Painter who represents this area on the Napa City Council she shares our goal of protecting and preserving the well being of the community in Southwest Napa and is ready to collaborate. I will do everything I can in my role as a trustee and a community member to advocate for and participate in productive partnerships with local government officials and agencies to benefit the residents of this area and mitigate the negative impact this decision will have on the neighborhood. Switching gears, I would like to respond to all of the comments saying that it is the wrong choice to end a successful program like River. I know if the board votes tonight to approve this path forward, it will be incredibly painful to the current River community and all of its many supporters across our valley. If the district chooses to repurpose this campus to strengthen the K-12 DLI pathway, but it will not mean that the heart-centered whole child approach River has developed has to end. Right now, I'm feeling some pretty deep pain about this aspect of the proposal because I know that many of the wonderful dedicated educators and staff who supported and cared for my own two daughters are likely listening, knowing that they might think I don't value them or, find their pro or that I find their program disposable breaks my heart. River was ahead of the curve in so many ways. 
amplifying the importance of social emotional learning and demonstrating to the community its profound impact on creating positive school culture. Long before social emotional learning was an education buzzword, the Hawala whole child philosophy instills important skills and traits in students and helps them become self-directed, empathic, collaborative, creative, confident, and compassionate learners. However, I have to agree with the district's assessment that what River offers is not an academic program in the same way our DLI program is. Rather, it is a set of structures and supports that add value to the experience students have and contribute to a school culture of positivity, respect, and safety. Many parents have reached out with powerful stories of why they chose River for their children. Many of them focused on kids who, in their words, don't quite fit in, which I take to mean they don't fit the bill of a neurotypical heteronormative child. These stories have surfaced such a difficult truth that some parents and children feel they will not be emotionally safe at our larger traditional middle schools. Fair or not, real or perceived, this is a problem we must address district-wide. While there is nothing I can say to discount the loss that the river community will feel, I believe it's an appropriate choice to use the river campus to strengthen the DLI pathway we have in our district. All of our children deserve to benefit from the powerful approach River has developed, and that is the district's plan. I've heard a lot of pushback saying that River's program cannot be replicated at other sites. As a longtime teacher, I'm well aware of what it takes to change school culture what it takes to successfully implement a new program, and the difference between offering a workshop and a binder of materials, and what happens when teachers and staff are truly supported with time and resources necessary to implement a school-wide shift, and the support of setting aside and earmarking valuable instructional time to implement the program regularly. As we've heard from representatives from other middle schools, parts of the river approach are already part of their school culture. I have explored this issue of implementation and its potential challenges at length with Dr. Massetti and Ms. Andrew Jennings, raising my healthy skepticism about this transition. And I have their repeated and emphatic assurances that the district staff is committed and capable of a successful programmatic rollout across our remaining middle schools. I know the SEL approach and its structures evolved over time at River. That's the nature of education, trying things, seeing what works, what students respond to, what resonates, what sticks. I urge the district staff to seek to partner with River teachers and staff in sharing their knowledge of their program and the structures, activities, and lessons that they have been fine-tuning over the many years of their program. As we learn more details about plans for a strong rollout and successful implementation of this district-wide emphasis on social-emotional learning, I will continue to advocate for this and monitor the progress and planning, and I am excited about the potential for the meaningful positive impact as we expand this program to benefit all our students. Educating the children in a community is a profound obligation. It is an endeavor built on trust and commitment to educating and caring for children. I was a teacher for a full decade before I became a parent. And the day that I walked out of the kindergarten classroom on the first day of school, leaving behind my sweet, beautiful firstborn daughter in the care of her wonderful teacher, I understood that trust in a new and deep way. And now here I sit on the Board of Education as a trustee. It's right in the title, the community has entrusted me with all of the district's children. I have committed to using my experience 
my analysis, my judgment, and my compassion to make the best decisions in the interests of each and every student in the district, not just my two daughters, not just my neighbor's sons and daughters, not just the students at Harvest and River, every single student. For me, this has been wrenching. This decision about school closures and program redesign has been the last thing swirling around in my mind as I lay my head on the pillow at night and on most days for the past several weeks, the first fully formed thought upon waking. As I said, it comes down to trust in the end. I trust Dr. Massetti and her team, not blindly, not unquestioningly, but based on my observation and my experience. I trust their integrity, their passion for excellence, their commitment to the students of our community. This is a difficult decision and there is no perfect solution to the challenges we face. There is no joy in closing schools. But I ask the community to trust me when I say that difficult as this is, I believe this is the best, most equitable path forward in honoring our obligation to our students and their families. And therefore, for I will support the task force recommendation of scenario G. Thank you, Trustee Marzo. Trustee Water. Thank you. And thank you. I too spoke to uh, Beth Painter this week. She's getting around, that's good. Um, okay, I too would like to thank the, uh, the, the um, speakers tonight and last week and all the people who wrote to me. And yes, indeed, I read every one of your letters. I tried to answer them all. Some of you, I told, some of you all I wrote and said that I couldn't write much because I had a, a hand issue um, and a um, stupid accident. But I enjoyed hearing from all of you. Um, and I went out with some people for coffee, different, different folks. And, um, you know, they're going to disagree with um, my vote tonight, but I enjoyed meeting you very much. Um, and I hope to see you again. I guess what I'd first like to do is address something that one of our speakers said um, earlier. Uh, we had a speaker who said she doesn't want to, her children to end up in a place like Camille Creek or Valley Oak. And I can only assume that, well, she's not uh, familiar with, um, with those uh, young people. Camille Creek is the County Office of Education School. It's a place, it's a court school. Um, it's a place where uh, young people who have made uh, foolish choices go. And many of them return to our school system and do well. Um, they're just kids. Everyone's entitled um, a few chances when they're young. And uh, the last time I checked, um, Ms. Caroline Wilson ran the place and she is a superior educator and one of the finest people I've ever met. Um, Valley Oak is our continuation school. Um, it's the Napa Valley Unified con um, Continuation School. I, I began my career here teaching at the old Temescal out at Harvest, where Harvest was um, before it was Harvest. And, uh, and um, our principal is Maria Cisneros. Uh, I worked with her at Napa High. She is, again, a fantastic person. We are so lucky to have her. And the school has received uh, all sorts of recognition for being a superior, a top-notch continuation school. And if you've met the students who came and were recognized for student of the month, you would say that they're the sort of people you'd be just fine with your own children associating with. So um, I just wanna make that very clear. Okay, now I've got my audio visual aid. I will hold it up. You know, I'm very low tech. Okay, this newspaper is a, mm, let's see, Friday, March 26, 2021, not very long ago. This is a $999,000 house in what used to be a working class neighborhood. 
uh, it actually went for 13% over. There were 12 days between the listing and the offer. And about a week after it closed, it was being advertised as an eight way timeshare for $184,000 per share. That's almost a half million dollar profit. This is on top this is on top of an apartment house in my neighborhood that became a bed and breakfast recently. And uh, the vacation rentals that pop up in residential neighborhoods, um, you know, it all adds up. Pretty soon you're losing housing stock. And by the way, the, the uh, headline in tomorrow's register will be Napa home sales soar, multiple offers, the new normal. And ladies and gentlemen, the question is, is Napa a town or is it a brand? We have a fatal proximity to the Golden Gate Bridge and just past it live some of the richest people in the world, billionaires. Until recently, half of the top 10 richest people of all lived in Northern California. A couple moved recently to escape taxes. One of them actually went to, got New Zealand citizenship. A couple of them live in Seattle because, you know, it's a cool place and there was no corporate or personal income tax. That's right. I'm talking Microsoft and Amazon. And I'll bet you thought it was all because Jeff Bezos liked to eat salmon. Several billionaires paid no federal in income tax at all. I learned that by uh, reading, about, reading Oxfam's work on that. And lots of very rich people pay nothing in taxes. And there was, the cry is always, but they're so philanthropic. And I guess I could find a billionaire. I mean, people have suggested this and try to get a donation, but you can't run public schools on private charity. We can't, and we shouldn't have to. Everybody should pay his or her fair share of taxes. And we all know many wealthy people have second or third or fourth homes in our very, in our very own county. And it's disconcerting and confusing to see that and then read about how the schools are in financial straits. I can tell, I can tell because of the letters I've been getting. But this is why young families can't afford to come to Napa and this is why we're talking about shutting down schools. It's not for fun and it's not a great plot. Housing is expensive and we don't have enough students to fill our buildings. Previous speakers have said this, it's true. Did you know that next to Santa Cruz, Napa has the biggest, this thing keeps sliding down, sorry, but I am vaccinated kids. Napa has the big, and it's okay because I'm 70 years old. Napa has the biggest disconnect between housing costs and local salaries. This has been true for several years. During normal times, our roads are clogged with workers who commute to Napa because they can't afford to live here. Um, I remember a previous board member talked about how her farm workers were driving, the farm workers she knew were driving for hours to come here. They were coming from Yuba. Um, I received a couple of letters who suggested that the California environmental quality statutes might affect whether or not a school bus can go from Harvest to North Napa. Because of open enrollment, we have cars running all over town, in addition to our out-of-county labor force, and CEQA has allowed that. CEQA has, that's fine. Is help on the way? I am told that there will be new housing developments coming on board. My questions are, for whom will this housing be built and when? We've all been waiting for Napa Pipe, also known as Costco for quite a while. And I listen to the city council's general plan meetings all the time. Um, and I listen to planning commission meetings. I listened to one the other night. I'm told that there will be housing built out by Foster Road. Well, I drove out to by there recently and I, there are signs. There's a complete row of signs protesting any new development. This neighborhood wants its green belt too. People are resistant to change. And I have a suggestion to our citizens, get involved, follow the planning commissioners, both city and county, the city council, the board of supervisors, call them up. They're listed. They are not stuffy people. They're friendly, they're accessible, but they are the land use decision makers. We aren't. And as previous speakers have said, we have many functions that aren't strictly educational, food, food delivery, um, we're really good at that, mental health come to mind, and we've got other interventions too. But other, other governmental interests do land use. And I was on the city council, as some of you know, and every so often I drive past 
an affordable housing project that I helped get approved. It was a 3-2 vote. They were never 5-0 votes. It wasn't unanimous. It's tough. There was lots of neighborhood resistance to this. I see another property that magically became storage units, not affordable family housing, after neighbor complaints. That was in West Napa. And an apartment a site that was down zoned to single family housing. That was in North Napa. Neighbors protested another development in Southeast Napa. It was stalled for years, years. When it finally was built, it was transformed into senior housing. All right, I am a senior and I say, we need housing for young families. I think more citizens need to be involved, but I will tell you the very qualities that make life so pleasant here, the protected ag land and the slow growth have helped drive up housing costs that and supply and demand and a certain type of capitalism, very hard boiled capitalism, bare knuckles in fact. Really, I think the greatest danger facing Westwood which others have said, it's not the possible closing of harvest, but gentrification. And um, I'm also going to point out that should harvest close down, it's not going to be an educational desert there. We have um, Napa Valley Language Academy that's very popular and we have a beautiful new school, snow school. And by the way, let me segue into someone wrote to me and wanted to know what we spent all the school bond money on. Okay, we can't use school bond money for our operating expenses. That's been addressed. All right, we built River School. A lot of new construction there. We um, collapsed two schools and created Willow School, new school. Uh, we're almost done with Napa Junction and we built Snow School. We uh, did, um, uh, we're constructing a new multi-purpose room at American Canyon Middle School. We put in a new central kitchen. We have several satellite kitchens, Chromebooks for every child. No one else did that. Nobody else did that. And you know, odds and ends like new turf at American Canyon High School. And you know, that does add up. I don't relish clothing, closing schools. I like to make people happy. But to repeat, we have room for twice as many middle school students as are enrolled. We are paid by the state based on enrollment. I want all of our students to have access to an enriched curriculum. I don't want us to go into receivership. Yes, uh, other people have, um, have referenced it. Parents, I've had parents who are, I'm sure otherwise very sensible people suggest that a state takeover is a viable option. Well, just look how well that turned out for the Oakland community. Oakland lost control of its schools. And I know we've been through several com uh, community traumas and the whole world has suffered through COVID except for the billionaire class who are richer than ever. One thing we've learned from the pandemic, if we didn't learn it in 2005 with Katrina and 2008 with the Wall Street collapse is that many of us live precarious lives. Look at what happened to our hospitality and winery workers when we got shut down. Remember how the food bank needed to call in the National Guard because it was so busy. And I, yet I keep hearing people say, we are Napa Valley. Well, all due respect, we are that, but we're also a community with haves and have nots. Um, and parents know this which is why many are jockeying for every advantage possible for their child to keep from sliding down the socioeconomic ladder. As I said, it is human nature. Another way to help children rise, all of our children, is to improve the programming at our schools. This is where we get our social mobility. And as it is, even with the work that still needs to be done, I taught at Na next door at Napa High for 15 years, and I've seen so many students from relatively uneducated backgrounds go on in life and become very successful. They're running nonprofits. They're going to grad school at some top universities. They're going to law school, medical school, going into trade unions, going into politics, writing, painting, acting, farming, cooking, even teaching, doing high-end construction. You know, they're doing the whole gamut and it all started with public education. It is easy to fo focus on the negative. 
it's great. It's great, isn't it? To be sarcastic and, um, and put down somebody's best efforts, um, someone who's trying his or her best. But you know what, I'm not gonna do that. I don't, I'm not gonna do that. There's enough negativity in the world. I would like to see some of the famous, our legendary Napa can do spirit after we make our decision, whatever it is, instead of throwing each under the bus, each other under the bus or uh, threatening to go to um, private school, why not work together? Why not work together to create the best schools in California? We have a lot of talent here, we do. Why not? We can do it. And um, I remember when the man who held the seat before I did, Tom Kensock, and believe me, uh, his daughter spoke. Uh, she's a teacher at um, Pueblo Vista. Uh, she spoke at the last meeting. Um, Tom Kensock and I had many very friendly disagreements, many of them. But he said something that I return. I remember at the, I mean, I used to come just like the speakers. I used to come to the podium when we had a podium and, um, you know, um, wail on the school board. And now, you know, they're all having their revenge because I'm here. And, but he said at the end of his last term, and, you know, you really get people speaking from the, from the heart when, you know, the journey's over. He said, really all he'd ever wanted to do is make the schools better. And that's what I want too. That's what I want too. That's what we all want. And I really believe we can do this if we work together. And um, I am going to, um, I am going to support um, the committee's Measure G. Um, uh, I do welcome the idea, by the way, of um, Browns Valley K through eight. And those of you who got letters from me last month who wrote to me about it, know that I wasn't such an enthusiast at first. So um, I didn't have my mind made up. And I'm glad that we're gonna try that at, at um, Shearer School because um, perhaps uh, some of the uh, students from the Westwood neighborhood would like to come over there. Um, it's a great place and it's only a couple blocks from my house. So um, thank you all for listening to me. And um, let's, let's move forward. Let's, let's be the, the community that everybody thinks we are. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Water. Before we continue, I do need to, um, didn't want to interrupt you, um, that we extend our meeting. I'll move to extend. Need to pick a time to extend? 1 a.m. Recommendation. 1 a.m.? Just to have plenty of time. Hope we never get there. We do like to spend our Friday mornings together in the gym. So it's okay. All right, can you second that motion? I do. So first by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Jankowicz, student board rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Jane, oppose that? Okay, thank you. Aye. Trustee Chu, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so I want to also thank all of the community members who participated on the task force and who uh, communicated with me by email and by phone and in-person meetings. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the advocacy that, that you all had for your students and the passions that you gave, because this is what we need of our parents to advocate for our students. I also like to thank the staff for preparing a lot of information for everybody and to take the time to answer our questions. Um, so I, I approached this process by looking at the guiding principles that were given to the task force members, because I think they're sound. Those are very good um, principles to go by. So the four principles, in case you forgot, which I don't think anybody forgot, um, program excellence, fiscal solvency, responsible facilities management, and equity. And I, I did go through the process that all of the task force members did to rank each of those for each of the scenarios. And I'll say that the hardest one that for me to rank was equity. And I, I, it was very hard for me to see any of those scenarios being equitable for 
for actually anybody. Um, everyone is impacted by school closures. And I couldn't really get my hands or, or thoughts around why it was that it was so difficult until I took, um, so last uh, Friday and Saturday, um, me and a couple of other new trustees took the uh, Master in Governance Finance class. And we really got a deep dive into what it means to be in school finance. And school finance is not equitable. School finance does not give us enough funds to be equitable. And in a declining enrollment environment, it becomes even less so. And so that is why it was so difficult for many of the task force members to really, you know, say 100% that they stand behind anyone. And although we do have some, you know, uh, I know, I know um, scenario G was the one that came out on top. I don't think that everyone was completely comfortable with it. And I think it's a lot of that equity piece because I struggled with that equity piece. And so what am I left with? I'm left with the other three that don't really, I mean, there's some equity in there, but it really doesn't, it's not where we want to go. And you know, that is one of our, our strategic goals is to have equity in everything we do. And I struggle because I'm not able to in this instance. Um, and I, I think one of the task force members, uh, Orlando Carrion, um, said, you know, that equity needs to be everywhere. And I totally agree. I, I, I'm trying my best to think about every one of those through an equity lens. But it is not equitable to close a school in a, a high needs neighborhood. It is not a, you know, a, any other scenario, um, it is not equitable to have to bus or, or, you know, move 800 kids from Redwood to another campus. Um, I'll go back to my hometown. It is not equitable for a thousand kids to be on a 10 acre campus when all the other middle schools are on a 30 acre campus. So none of this is equitable. So it made a really difficult decision, unfortunately, easier by just looking at numbers, which I really hate. And I know I, I'm a scientist and I look at numbers to drive my decisions, but this is the one time that I really didn't want to have to do that because I thought that you know this equity piece is gonna be reshaping the way I'm looking at things, but I wasn't able to. And so I, it's with a very heavy heart that I, I, I feel like I need to support the scenario that was, is presented in the resolution. Um, but I do, I do recognize that um, a lot of parents have spoken out about how great small middle schools are. So I, I need to share this very personal um, experience of mine. And my, my, it's about my eldest son, uh, who is a seventh grader at ACMS. ACMS has a thousand, over a thousand kids on a 10, 10 acre campus. When I first, I, and I shared that I got into under, you know, wanting to learn more about school board functions when ACMS2 was being considered to be built. And I was, I was on board with a smaller school. I really felt like that was gonna be great for my son because my son is not neurotypical. He has ADHD. He will be the first to tell you, by the way, so I'm not disclosing anything that he doesn't want me to disclose. He, um, is, is, he has a brilliant mind, but that comes at a cost. It came at a cost of him not developing his ability to have um, very strong social emotional um, capabilities. Um, I mean, he, he's not completely, you know, not, he, he's not completely, you know, off the charts, but he does have problems having social, meaningful social interactions with his peers. And he will also tell you that too. So <laughs> this is not something I am disclosing without his knowledge. Um, and I really worried about him. And when uh, the idea that maybe we could have a small middle school in American Canyon, I was, I was all for it because I thought, 
oh, you know, I, and I knew about the river program. So I thought, well, maybe a smaller school would help him and, and really be able to do that for him uh, to, to really, you know, build on his social emotional learning. Um, of course, you know, because of fiscal solvency issues at the time we had, I, I think the school district made the right choice in, in canceling that project. Um, and so he is now in the 1000 student school on a small footprint. But I'll tell you something that I learned from my son. In the first week that he went into this large middle school, which I thought was humongous. Um, I mean, he did come from Canyon Oaks, which is the largest elementary school at a, about at that time, it was over 700 kids. And I thought, oh, well, it's still, you know, several hundred more, you go to a thousand students. But at the middle school, he reconnected with a friend that he had not seen since third grade. And I had no idea that he still even remembered um, his friend. Um, and he realized that, hey, there's, there's still, you know, some, some meaning to his relationship and he still remembered it. His, his friend also remembered him and they started talking and they, they found a common interest in uh, Dungeons and Dragons. He'll tell you about Dungeons okay. and Dragons <laughs> forever if, if you just talk to him. So he, he actually took the courage and said, you know what, I, I think I would like to start a club. And so he, re he himself reached out to his teacher and said, can I start a club? Maybe once a week we can meet and I'll open it up to um, whoever wants to join. And he did. I was very, very proud of him that he even took that first step. Of course, I was afraid, you know, is anyone gonna join his club? It turned out that there were over 10 kids that wanted to join his club. And these 10 kids came from all of the different elementary schools in American Canyon. And had he gone to a small school that's within walking distance to my house, he would have gone to a school that was smaller than his elementary. I think the, the pool of kids that might even have interest of what he has interest in would be smaller. And so I want to say that, you know, as, as much as we think, you know, small schools are great, I, I was that parent as well. I think there's something to be said about going into a larger school where you can find the, the possibilities of you finding people who are, um, you know, more, more similar to you and where you can make a connection is greater. And so I, I do want to, and I'm not saying that this happens to everybody, but I do want to share a personal story that it did happen. And I was very shocked when it happened um, and very pleasantly surprised. And I will say that the faculty, the, the staff at the middle school, it's great. And I know there's, you know, there's concerns about whether or not we can expand certain programs into larger middle schools. Your, the, the teachers are wonderful. They love their students. They will do everything in their power to make sure that whatever situation that they're in, in terms of you know, teaching at a small school or a big school, they will try their best to make it happen. And I see that it, at American Canyon Middle School. So I don't wanna discount the fact that, you know, not, yes, not every child, you know, that the big middle school fits for every child, but it does work and it has worked. And it has worked for my non-neurotypical child. So I, I just want to put it out there because I, I think we don't give credit to um, our teachers and some of the benefits of having large middle schools enough. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Tristy Chu. Um, we are reaching our um, two hour mark where we take a break. Um, so why don't we go and do that and then we'll finish um, with board comment. Um, so let's take a five minute break. Okay.
Welcome, everybody. Okay, um, Trustee Dooley, go ahead. Thank you, President Gonzalez Morris. Um, I have the privilege of going after many of you, which is helpful for me. Um, be before I participate in today's discussion, I would like to uh, address the fact that I, uh, my wife is a staff member at River Middle School and my daughter attends the school there. Um, while it hasn't been raised as an issue, I do want to make sure that the record is clear that uh, these facts do not raise a conflict of interest that would uh, prevent or prohibit me from participating in the discussion and voting on this agenda item. In consultation with district council, I have examined both board policy 9270 and the Fair Political Practices Act and concluded that I have no disqualifying conflict of interest. Um, key to that conclusion is that uh, there is no financial impact on my family uh, as a result of this decision. Uh, whether or not uh, the schools are closed or repurposed, my wife will still have a job with the district and my daughter will still be a student in the district. Uh, she actually will be out of middle school in the implementation year. Um, second, any impact on my family is not unique to me or my family. It would be uh, the same impact that many families will, will experience should the, the, the resolution pass. Um, and since there's no financial impact or unique impact, uh, I am not prohibited from participating unless I, I believe that I am so biased for personal reasons that I cannot be objective and that I cannot make a decision that is in the best interest of the district as a whole. I am confirming that that is not the case. I take seriously my charge to represent the entire district and it's over 16,000 students and nearly 1500 staff members and have analyzed this proposal in that light as I would have any other school being considered. Um, with that said, I, um, this has been an agonizing decision for me. Um, I, in my non-school board life, I observe a lot of uh, boards and agencies make tough decisions. Um, I've seen the process that goes into that. Um, and I've seen from behind the scenes how much work that staff puts into any agenda item, but most importantly, difficult ones. So I, I must commend the staff, then Dr. Musetti, for preparing uh, a, an agenda item that is very difficult to write, very difficult to, um, to uh, present, and that represents many, many dozens of hours of work um, that uh, is necessary just to get it to, the, to our, our, our uh, board meeting. I also wanna thank the members of the task force and the many members of the public who have contacted us uh, or, or spoken at these meetings. Um, it's vital to our process have public input. Uh, it's, it's important that we hear from people, uh, not necessarily to, um, because our decisions are, 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 are influenced by the changing winds of, of public sentiment, but because that's the, those are the, the constituents that we represent. Um, the, this decision, as I said, has been agonizing I, for me. There are no easy parts to it. There's no low hanging fruit that we can say, this is you know, a simple decision. It has required an immense amount of work. I know that every one of us here has done uh, a lot to get to a point where we make this, this extremely difficult decision. It's also a decision that is not one of judgment of the quality of schools that are on the, uh, that are represented in the, in the resolution. We're not um, deciding 
based on um, any failures at these schools. Um, this is a decision that as trustees, we are responsible for managing and we have a duty to manage the resources of the district to provide uh, the best educational opportunity for each and every student. The, it's not a responsible thing for us to have facilities that have over 1500 vacancies uh, at the middle school level. It's not a responsible use of our resources to allow that number to grow annually to the point where we have more than two schools worth of vacancies. So this isn't just about money um, either. This is, this is a holistic decision to address the, uh, the, the, the proper use and management of our resources. One of the reasons I think that this was so difficult for me was I kept breaking down the decision into pieces, thinking that that would be a, a better way to, to look at it. Um, when I did that, I found the value in each part of, the, of, of what we are considering today, uh, the value in each school that we, that, that we are addressing, um, I have, you know, visited cam the, the campuses. I have spoken with staff and, and with the, the site principals. I, it's, it can't be broken down into its constituent parts. The reason is because this proposal is, is the first step in a vision for our middle school landscape. This isn't a, uh, a reactionary decision, despite the fact that we are addressing a budgetary need. This is an opportunity to holistically address the middle school programming in a way that uh, is both fiscally responsible and with the goal of providing academic excellence and uh, with, a, with an eye toward the whole student for each and every student. The DLI program, uh, as uh, others have mentioned, is the only K through 12 pathway program that the district uh, currently has. The DLI program is designed uh, for English learners. It's it celebrates bilingualism and biculturalism in a way that is, is intended to uh, support English learners and, and develop um, academic excellence in two languages. Moving to the, a new dedicated campus is not a shot in the dark. Um, we know that many DLI students uh, come from uh, outside of the current harvest uh, boundaries, and they they already commute to the program. We also know that it's it's that the current enrollment at the the lower elementary grades is much larger than the current middle school enrollment. It it there's a projection of filling the Salvador campus in the next five years with the DLI program. In the meantime, we have the opportunity to focus uh, on, on language, to have a, a consistency in the programming at that campus um, that to, to support the, the DLI program while it grows. Um, as for Rivers Socio-Emotional Learning Program, I, um, it, it, I'm sad to see that. Um, the, the, I'm sad to see that go uh, it, as a standalone program. I'm, I, I have grown to, to I, I know my daughter's experience there has been 
um, enriching, and I have no doubt uh, about the experiences of any of the families who have spoken about River. Um, the teachers that uh, we've we've encountered have are excellent, um, and I know that it's very difficult to implement uh, an SEL program at a large scale from the top down, but I do believe that the benefits of that that model uh, are are beneficial to everybody. There's no reason that somebody at a, a larger school should not be supported, uh, should not be provided the, the, um, the self, uh, should not be provided the opportunity to develop as a, an individual person. Um, this proposal includes a commitment to program excellence at the middle school that I believe must include a consideration of socio-emotional learning uh, at the large middle schools. Um, I hope that, um, that despite the grieving that we all will go through as we uh, transition through uh, following this decision, that we can roll up our sleeves and make this work for all students. Um, Students, children um, see how adults respond to difficulties. They, they feel that and, and that's their experience. Um, I hope that we can be positive examples for students as we um, make this, this transition. And as we try to, uh, and, and, and strive to achieve the vision that this uh, plan represents. Um, I also agonized over the impact that this decision will have uh, on the community surrounding Harvest. And I, I, I can't add much more than what other trustees have about um, you know, our role as a, an educational agency um, compared to, to the other local agencies. Um, and if I didn't have the confidence in this board's commitment to the conscious disposition of the harvest site, to the um, focus on what, um, what role we might play in this community, I would uh, have trouble supporting this. Um, if I had any concern that this decision really was a divestment of the uh, district in that community, I wouldn't support it. I am confident that we uh, as a board will um, direct and, and staff uh, will enact um, a plan for that site that will bring, um, will, will support that community um, and, and in the ways that, that, are, that are needed and ways that we can control. Um, I think, you know, consistent with our role of representing each and every student across the district, um, this proposal needs to be viewed from that, that, that um, step back from that, that broader perspective of, of um, the vision that, that we have for, for uh, the district and for middle schools in particular. Um, the, the financial aspects are obviously necessary, um, as many have said, but this isn't a decision purely reacting to, to our financial situation. Um, and for that reason, I, uh, I support the resolution as presented and um, I am ready to roll up my sleeves uh, to address the second part uh, and, and third part and fourth part of this vision that, that we have. Um, and I invite the, the, the public to be a part of that as they have in this process and you know as as i expect they will in in our future decisions so
Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Dooley. Our student board rep, Carla Magana. Yes. All right. So I want to start off by saying thank you to everyone that invested their time into this proposal, uh, whether it was in favor or against um, Dr. Musetti, your whole team, all the trustees, uh, all the advocates, and just everyone in the community. Um, I always enjoy being here on the board along with everyone else. I feel like I learn something new every time I'm here, which is really nice. Feels rewarding. Um, I think for all of us, uh, it's been a really difficult process um, to decide what to vote um, and just looking at all the different um, uh, information that's been kind of laid out for everyone. Uh, I've tried to use my perspective as a student the most I can in order to find uh, what's most equitable for all students in the district. Uh, after hearing all the public comments from past meetings, uh, it had driven me to solely focus on the emotional aspect of closing a school. But realistically, um, I realized that we have to focus on the facts. And like Trustee Shu, Shu said earlier, um, in this case, it feels dreadful to do that. Um, I had to learn to ground myself and look at the proposal from all kinds of angles and perspectives. Uh, after having many conversations with family, friends, and trustees, it became more clear to me that looking at the facts and data would lead to a more equitable outcome for not just middle school students, but for all of MVSD uh, in the coming years. Although closing ho harvest and reinventing, re reinventing river would divide a portion of our middle school students, it would give MVUSD a chance to invest in more programs and enhance learning for all students. And I believe that is the equity we should, be we should all be focusing on. I think that this is a difficult yet necessary opportunity for students to receive a richer education and become, become more prepared for challenging high school courses. Uh, with that being said, I'm saddened by the fact that another campus needs to close, but excited to see where learning goes in each classroom. So I am in favor of the proposal. Thank you to our student board rep. Um, um, I had a whole uh, speech prepared, but um, I think all the words have been said <laughs> tonight and I, um, I find myself in, in this position of completely agreeing with all of you and um, just really um, reflecting on that sense of how um, our own board is, is diverse with their perspective and their expertise and knowledge. We have scientists, we have educators, we have lawyers, we have and um, experience in finance. Um, we have um, various stories to share and um, and you know and I think I'm I'm left with a lot of um, just feeling thankful for all the hard work that's been put into place and all the um, the emotions that has um, carried us along the way I, I think I'm now left with and I think I'm when you're in this position as board president and you hear of everything else it's been so new for me, because um, I, I, I am left with then tapping into the human emotion of things. And, um, and that's the piece of me that I, I do have to, you know, make sure that I am um, sharing what I'm going through, what we're as, you know, uh, uh, in this role, but definitely um, as a board that all of you have shared um, in terms of the impact that this, um, can, can have, especially to our vulnerable populations. And I, sometimes I have a hard time with that word and, and disadvantaged and misrepresented. And and because um, I think, um, especially having been raised in that kind of um, I don't know, environment and, and being raised in, in, a, in a home where when we moved here and immigrated here, we were, we were faced with poverty. We were faced with food insecurity, um, we were faced with um, lots of challenges, housing, even back then, um, very difficult. And um, and just that's where I'm feeling most connected with is especially with our populations that I know are surviving right now. And you've heard me say that many times. And um, the thought of causing any additional pain to that 
is something that we all share here and we feel that, but we're being very strategic and I trust of the processes we've put in place. I have in faith in our, in our administrators and all of you and everybody who's also um, commented in, in that we care very deeply about our kids and that's something no one can argue um, with us. And uh, although some have argued and I think that's the part that um, um, I'm trying to convey here is that we do care. We are, we are, we are a group of people who are from the community and we're here to represent our community and the voices that we have to share. Um, but it does, it does um, pain me to see that I had a um, lot of reflection and especially um, my mother comes to mind, right? Um, having her raise us and, um, and I think some of you have heard my story um, of, of how um, we didn't have a car and um, I had to walk to take the bus and rain or shine, right? And um, my mother, uh, because we didn't have a car, um, she would have to ride her bike to work. And coincidentally, her path to work was the same path to my school, which is Silverado Middle School. And rain or shine, um, my bus would, and it's, it was always, I always knew it. I always knew to look over and I always sit on the right side of the bus because I knew that I would run into my mom riding her bicycle to work. I just knew it. And I would have my classmates, you know, be like, yeah, you know, I'd be like, that's my mom. They're like, that's your mom? It's like, it's raining. I'm like, she's going to work. Um, she's making it happen. And so, and I, and I wanna share that human side of, of me. And I know many of you have shared your human side of, of, of what you have shared, because at the end of the day, we, we do care and it's real. It's very real for us. I know you're not in the boardroom and I know it's late and I know you're listening and I know you, you know, our public has been following what we're doing, but this is, this is very real. And I, and I take that very, very seriously. And we all take that very, very seriously. Because the thought of closing a campus, um, it's like harvest. It's like closing the doors on my mom, it feels that way. And um, nobody wants to do that. I don't want to do that. But I wish we've been asked to, to vote with our hearts and I wish I could vote with my heart, but I cannot ignore the data and I can't ignore the finances. And I can't ignore the 17,000 kids we have in our care. So that being said, why don't we take the next step as we have now um, reached a point and, um, and do that. So now in addressing our item K1B, which is the adoption of the resolution number 21-23, approving closure of Harvest Middle School and reconfiguration of River Middle School into a language academy campus, determining that the project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act. This is a resolution, so I will ask Vera um, to please take roll call. Student Board Member Magana? Aye. Trustee Gonzalez Mares? Aye. Trustee Jankowitz? Aye. Trustee Gracia? Aye. Trustee Reiser? Aye. Trustee Water? Aye. Trustee Shu? Aye. Trustee Dooley? Aye. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you all. And um, thank you, everybody. And um, please continue to join us um, and stay with us. And think of NBUSD. Um, and we look forward to having you um, as we move forward with our next steps. Okay, let us now scroll back up to our agenda.
Okay. All right, so we are now um, returning to agenda um, H, which is the reports. This is now um, time for our Board of Education and Student Board Representative to provide reports, so. Um, nothing for me tonight. Uh, happy Earth Day, everyone. It's the last 30 minutes of it. <laughs> That's true. Happy Earth Day to you, too. Um, would you like to start, Trustee Gracia? Okay. So on April 1st, my term officially started as the CSBA representative for Napa County. On the 6th, I attended the Napa County Office of Education board meeting. On the 6th, I also attended the Middle School Redesign Task Force meeting. On the 8th, I visited Harvest Middle School. Also on the 8th, we had the Celebration of Schools Special Board meeting. On the 9th, I met with some parents who were concerned about the state of band and NVUSD. On the 12th, I attended the Calistoga School Board meeting. And on the 13th, uh, the Facilities and Tech Technology meeting. I too attended the middle school redesign and task force meeting, the celebration of schools board meeting, the facilities and tech. And I think like all of us have dedicated our last few weeks to community engagement. Thank you, Trustee Grassi and Jake Alex. Trustee Reiser. Um, as Trustee Jenkowitz uh, mentioned, I also have spent the last several weeks engaging with stakeholders um, regarding the proposed school closure. Um, last weekend, I attended the third course in the Masters in Governance training, which was focused on school finance. That was um, Friday and Saturday morning. Um, and on the 19th, I attended the Special Education Community Advisory Committee meeting. Thank you, Trustee Reiser. Um, would you like to go next, Trustee Water? Just going down the line here. Sure. Um, um, I too, you know, met with uh, various people in, in the community, concerned people. Um, today, I went to the uh, stu the the students' uh, climate group. Uh, they had an Earth Earth Day um, art show, virtual art show. They had uh, 17, 17 finalists, and one of them is my fellow trustee's daughter. I was talking to a delightful young woman with a different last name from you, and I didn't put it together until she said, oh, you're going into a board meeting. Oh, well, you'll see my mother there. It was very funny, and um, it was great. Uh, a variety of different art, different art pieces. And these children just did such a fabulous job organizing it, prizes and everything. And um, let's see, I did have, um, I did go to the, uh, we had a policy committee meeting, but um, I shoved, uh, shoved it off on Lisa or, or Jason to do the report. So that's good. That was a good move. And um, boy, I did a lot of uh, studying up on K through eight schools. And I did learn something else, which is Chuck, Gra uh, Chuck Grazel over at um, Redwood Middle School runs a blog for teachers called Tips for Teachers in a Hurry and Ways to um, Spiff Up Your, your um, Virtual Lessons, but it's something that can be used anytime. So I had fun looking at that. Yes, go ahead, Trustee Chu. So on March 26th, I joined Congressman Mike Thompson's Anti-Asian Violence Roundtable, where we talked about with um, over 20 community members in, in his district on um, what it was like to be Asian and Pacific Islander in, in California and some of the uh, racial tensions that we, we see, we experience. And um, I represented MVUSD, of course, and talked about how um, there's a lot of work that we're doing at the schools and schools are one of the first places where our children experience society. But, you know, a lot of this work about needing to change um, our social structures and, and to 
have equity and, and to have understanding of different cultures needs funding because we cannot just put that on our teachers and the staff. So I did advocate for funding there. Um, on April 6th, I attended the Middle School Redesign Task Force last session. And I also um, con connected with many community members. So thank you for, um, for reaching out. Um, on the 15th, um, I joined uh, my fellow trustees in the Policy Advisory Committee, uh, which I'll report out later. And um, last Friday on the 16th and Saturday 17th, um, I attended the Mastering Covenants class on school finance. And that's it for me. Go ahead, Trustee Dooley. So I, um, I've done a couple site visits uh, on in March 25th, the day after our last business meeting, um, I toured Redwood Middle School and River Middle School. Uh, and then recently I uh, uh, toured Harvest. Uh, I also attend, uh, observed the Middle School Redesign Task Force. Um, I, Last week, I had the Facilities and Technology Committee meeting and the Policy Committee meeting, and I'm grateful that I don't have to report out on both. Um, I also attended the Masters in Governance course on school finance, a very timely course uh, and very well developed. I do wanna say that I really appreciate uh, Assistant Superintendent Manguala, who uh, in our new trustee, orientation process met with us one-on-one. -on -one. I felt more prepared than I think a lot of the, the board members uh, from other districts. And uh, it was very, very helpful um, to have known a lot of that terminology and, and have a, a primer from, from uh, Mr. Manguala. So thank you for that. Um, and then I too have engaged in a lot of community outreach and, and uh, emails, meetings, uh, phone calls and that sort of thing. Um, and that's my report. Thank you, Trustee Dooley. Um, I attended the, in addition to a lot of the other meetings I've attended with all of you, uh, the DLAC meeting last night. And um, um, just was really impressed by my fellow, her name is Elba as well. <laughs> So I was really impressed by uh, President Elba of, of the DLAC, um, you know, just running it. Um, and Elba Marquez running um, the, the, the group. And so many of this, the, count, the sites, um, ELAC members were there and uh, participating and just um, really wonderful to see that, that process and, and growing and, and seeing the, the representation from all the schools. So I look forward to um, continuing to, to hear from them and, and um, in a, and as a process that uh, Dr. Mercedi has mentioned that we are, are um, wanting to um, um, embrace more and, and have it be um, um, working, you know, as, as it should be. Um, so yeah, that was really, really good. Okay, so let's continue with board representative reports, curriculum and student support committee. We have not yet met. Facilities and technology committee. We met uh, last Tuesday at the 13th. Um, and it was a very uh, action-packed meeting, so I will try to keep this brief um, without speaking like the micro machines guy. Um, so we, we got an update from technology, including uh, new radio systems, which are operational, um, and we're working on training uh, and deployment to sites, uh, possibly starting with a pilot site uh, before full deployment. Um, we learned about a worldwide chip shortage, uh, which impacts uh, tech projects, especially the kind of length of time that it takes to, to complete the projects. Um, and uh, we also got an update on the new Napa Junction site. The network uh, is, was set to come online. I believe it, it, uh, that date has passed. Uh, they were doing testing but it's a, a complex process that, um, to ensure that all the systems are online. Um, from facilities, we got an update regarding the uh, ACMS Student Commons project, which is currently in the design approval stage. Uh, we are waiting for approval from the uh, Department of State Architect 
uh, which is expected in mid-May. Uh, the design is spacious and versatile with a reasonable amount of purple, uh, <laughs> the school color. Um, the, uh, there are temporary facilities in use uh, right now, which has required a, um, a minimal amount of improvements, but a very creative use of the uh, small campus space uh, at the site. Uh, demolition is currently underway of the old uh, structures with fencing in place for student state safety. Uh, and then construction on the project will begin um, after approval, of course, from the DSA. Uh, and there's working on planning for uh, construction through August of 2022. Um, there are a lot of site constraints that have made it difficult, but uh, there's been a very collaborative relationship between the district uh, maintenance and operations and the design build contractor, which has made that uh, go smoothly. Um, and then the commons will serve many functions from a, a, at a central location on the campus, including a library, a maker space, performance spaces, outdoor seating, uh, and of course, dining facilities. We also received a uh, an update or a, a a presentation about the maintenance and operations department, uh, including the kind of structures and roles, as well as the work that the, the department does. Uh, we, we welcomed Albert Sousa, uh, who leads the maintenance, and Gloria Aguiar, who leads operations. Um, maintenance includes many different skilled shops, including carpentry, glazing, plumbing, and electrical, uh, to name a few. And then operations includes uh, nearly 100 custodians serving all the district campuses and other facilities um, in the different capacities. Uh, maintenance and operations has developed a high level of communication, collaboration, and leadership by creating a culture that is focused on the pivotal role that they play in the district's uh, vision. Um, we also learned about work orders uh, and how they're managed uh, with light maintenance being done by custodians, complex, more complex skill intensive work being assigned to maintenance staff in their respective shops, and then larger, more complex work con contracted out uh, for, for work. Um, additionally, work orders are prioritized based on uh, kind of the emergent nature of the work. Uh, the department reviews work order counts weekly with uh, staff to encourage that work orders be closed out and to work on prioritizing the, the uh, needed work. As of the meeting on April 13th, there had been 798 work orders submitted this year. Um, and that was uh, on top of a backlog of uh, a lot more work orders. So the amount of, uh, of work that, that staff has, has been doing is, is kind of staggering. Um, we also talked about the summer maintenance work that will be underway once schools close for the summer. Um, they use all of the seven to eight weeks of summer to do uh, deep cleaning, to replace carpet, to rese reseal gym floors, uh, and perform uh, a lot of the work orders that couldn't be done while students are in classrooms. This year will be a little bit harder uh, with more district summer programs. So there is a, a need to kind of work around those schedules. So, uh, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Finance committee. We have not met. Not met. Mm -hmm. Policy committee. So on uh, April 15th, uh, we met um, on Zoom. And we had several items on the agenda. Um, the first item was grading for equity presentation by Joe Feldman from Crescendo. And that was a real enlightening um, presentation where equitable grading is based on accuracy, bias, being bias resistant and motivational for both students. And um, ended up being uh, for teachers as well. Um, some of this work has been ongoing in higher education and also in some school districts. So um, we won't be the first to be the guinea pigs, but what they have seen is that um, there are positive, qualitative, and quantitative uh, outcomes, such as um, reducing grade inflation and deflation, 
you reduce achievement disparities and there are correlations between grades and standardized tests. So um, I, we did ask about the timeline, how long does it take to implement? And it was between two and four years, depending on how much training and uh, uptake and, and actual impl implementation from the teachers. So it does take time to implement, um, but I think we were interested in, in seeing that work. Um, and I know we had a public comment about that today earlier. Um, there, the second item was um, policy updates recommended by the California School Board Association from December 2020, which will be an agenda item, J1A. So I won't go into detail since we will talk about it later. Um, then we have a couple of items that were related to safety issues. One was food service delivery. Um, and we were concerned that, you know, if we have these outside vendors delivering on campus, what does that mean when we have people who are not who are not fingerprinted and, and being on our campus? And so we were very concerned about that. Um, also, uh, we discussed open and closed campus for the high school. Um, I know that many of you know uh, at American Canyon High School, there was an incident of, of um, a couple of students that went on, off campus and they basically got mugged on the way back to campus. And it was very concerning. And I was actually there when it happened. I, was happen I happened to drive by. It was very scary. It was happened right next to our elementary school too. Oh. So it, it becomes not just a high school issue, but, but more, more neighborhood issue then. And so we were, um, <clears throat> we were, uh, for um, maybe limiting ninth and 10th graders. Um, and that actually also aligns with the, the laws about who you can take as a new driver, um, it, as a teenage new driver. Um, we also discussed and um, brought, wanted to bring forth a resolution against uh, Asian and Pacific Islander hate, which will be agenda item K1A. And we also discussed safe uh, firearm storage um, and discuss the resolution example from the Alameda School District, which actually aligns with the California Department of Education re recommended memorandum about uh, gun safety. And so we will um, be bringing that to the board in the future. Um, and uh, we did discuss uh, what some of the future uh, work on policy we would like to see. And one was um, following up to the resolution against AAPI hate that we will be looking at today. Um, work on relating to inclusion and equity for all. I think that that's our goal and that is our one of our strategic, strategic plans. And so I, we thought it was all very important to work on a policy on that as well. So that will come on a later date. And that concludes my report. Thank you, yeah, thank you for that update. Special Education Community Advisory Committee. Yes, we uh, met this Monday, uh, the 19th. Um, the SELPA director, Ginny Maywall, May -Wall, sorry, um, praised all of the local education agencies for getting through this year with creativity, communication, and articulation of goals. Um, and referenced again, the parent education and professional development series that they offer through the SELPA. Um, this year they offered a diagnostic seminar for parents in the fall and then a focus on mental health and wellness uh, with a psychologist. And they're starting to look um, and welcome input and suggestions to line up next year's trainings. Um, for example, like a parent education on the IEP process, how it works, what the chain of command is, um, the director reiterated that the financial situation for our SELPA is excellent. We have stable funding and excellent compliance, which is always good to hear. Um, the parent chairperson of the committee, Darcy Storms, reported about the inclusion awards, the annual inclusion awards that are coming along. There will be um, multiple people honored at our May 27th board meeting. And then also we will uh, see the uh, entries for the Multimedia Creativity Challenge for the theme, Be the One. 
Um, Terry Lynn Rossetti gave her director's report for our district um, and said that they are looking at the extended school year to serve the special ed students, mostly with moderate and severe disabilities um, who are eligible for uh, an extended school year, which is different than the extended learning opportunities uh, that are offered by the district, but they're really focused on those students who are really likely to experience regression in their progress with a long break over the summer. Uh, our assistant superintendent, Pat Andrew Jennings, gave the committee a summary of the NVUSD extended learning options for this summer um, and sort of explained how that information was going out. Um, the transition program, which serves those, uh, those special ed students that are uh, transitioning out of high school that have hired a director and it, that program is in progress, the, the development. Um, the parent chair, Darcy Storms, again, spoke to the importance, this was in rel relative to raising this middle school uh, redesign issue, and she sort of asked about, well, what, where are the special education students going to fit into that um, once the decision has been made? And she just surfaced, again, the importance of the inclusion of special ed education students in general education settings and amplified the idea that special ed students teach as much as they learn and they add value wherever they are placed in our district. I couldn't agree more. Um, I don't know if anyone from the community is listening at this point, but the, um, the committee is looking for help from the community in two ways. They are really seeking to have a, a bilingual parent to serve on the committee. So if anybody knows of a bilingual parent of a special ed child student in the district or in the county actually that would uh, be willing to serve and meet, meet um, on the committee, please uh, let, uh, let uh, Jenny Maywald know. And then also we're looking for donated items for prizes for the inclusion awards. Um, local businesses that might donate goods or gift certificates would be uh, most appreciated. Um, and again, you can reach out to Ginny Maywald at the County Office of Education. Um, and last, we were introduced to a new member of the committee from um, an LEA called Matrix Parent Network. Um, and that this is a nonprofit that used to serve four counties and now serves 18 counties in Northern California. Her, the director's name is Juana Madriz. Um, they have a parent training center in, that offers services in English and Spanish, offering support for families of students with special needs to support them in understanding and accessing services, getting trainings on IEPs, how to help parents review assessments and IEPs, um, how to access support groups, um, and I want to share both their website. It's called uh, Matrix Parent Network. So it's just, it's uh, www.matrixparents.org. Um, and they also have a helpline, which is 800-578-2592. Um, and that concludes that committee report. And I forgot to add in my report that I too attended the final session of the Middle School Redesign Task Force. It just was, it's been so long since our last general meeting, I forgot to add it to my report. <laughs> but that concludes my. Thank you, Trustee Riser. Um, City of American Canyon liaison representative. We will meet next month. Okay, thank you. City of Napa liaison representatives. Okay. Town of Yountville liaison representative. We have not yet met. Okay, thank you. Okay, superintendent and executive staff. Uh, President Gonzalez met us tonight. We will not have staff reports. All right, we will now move into approval of consent agenda. Second. I have a first and a second, a first by Trustee Jankowicz and a second by Trustee Gracia. Um, we'll need a roll call for this, Vera. Yes, student board member Magana. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez-Mares. Aye. Trustee Jankowicz. 
Aye. Christy Gracia? Aye. Christy Reiser? Aye. Christy Water? Aye. Christy Shu? Aye. Christy Dooley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Okay, we're now going on to item J1A. This is um, just the introduction to the California School Board Association's recommended policy updates that Trustee Chu referred to earlier. So I just had a quick comment. Wanted to highlight that board policy prevents the presentation of viewpoints on particular candidates or ballot measures in the classroom without giving equal time to the presentation of all perspectives, which includes opposing perspectives. Any other comments? These will be brought back for action on May 6th. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so we are now going to um, item K1A. This is the resolution 21-22 supporting people Resolution 2122 is supporting people of Asian ancestry and condemning harassment, violence, and hatred toward people of Asian descent. Move to approve. I'll, I'll definitely second. <laughs> and I, I want to make a comment and I want to thank the board for taking this up. I think it's important for especially American Canyon where we have the largest population of AAPI um, students. And it sends a strong message to our students that we do support them in, in going against hate. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, first by Trustee Gracia and a second by Trustee Chu. Uh, Vera, we, you could do roll call, please. Yes, student board member Magana. Aye. Trustee Gonzalez Mares. Aye. Trustee Jankowitz. Aye. Trustee Gracia. Aye. Trustee Reiser. Aye. Trustee Water? Aye. Trustee Shu? Aye. Trustee Dooley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I know we have moved um, the next agenda, K1B, but in the midst of my emotions, <laughs> I lost track of the actual official process of having a resolution. So I'm going to have you. Um, request to revisit that and um because we didn't do a first or a second we went straight to roll call so my apologies to have you go through that one more time but move to approve second i have a first by trustee gracia a second by trustee dooley vera if you could do roll call now yes student board member magana aye trustee gonzalez mares aye trustee jankowitz aye trustee gracia aye trustee reiser Aye. Trustee Water? Aye. Trustee Shu? Aye. Trustee Dooley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We will now go to item K2A, resolution 21-21 to issue tax and revenue anticipation notes. So moved. First by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Jankowix. Vera, if you could do roll call, please. Student board member Magana? Aye. Trustee Gonzalez Mares? Aye. Trustee Jankowitz? Aye. Trustee Gracia? Aye. Trustee Reiser? Aye. Trustee Water? Aye. Trustee Shu? Aye. Trustee Dooley? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. We're now into item K3A Declaration of Need of Fully Qualified Educators. So moved. Second. Our first by Trustee Gracia, a second by Trustee Water. All those um, uh, student board rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody oppose or abstain? Motion passes, thank you. K3B, proposed SCA NBUSD collective bargaining agreement effective January 1st, 2021 through December 31st, 2023. So moved. Second. A first by Trustee Gracia, a second by Trustee Dooley. Student Board Rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody oppose or abstain? Motion passes, thank you. K4A, ratification of Migrant Education Program District Service Agreement. So moved. Second. First by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Dooley. Student Board Rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any oppose or abstain? 
Motion passes, thank you. School plan for student achievement, item K4B. So moved. Second. <laughs> First by Trustee Gracia, a second by Trustee Dooley. Student board rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody oppose or abstain? Okay, thank you. K4C renewal MOU between City of American Canyon and NBUSD. So moved. I'll second. First by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Chu. Student board rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody oppose or abstain? Okay, thank you. Item K5A, temporary emergency facilities use agreement between Napa Valley Unified School District and Napa County. So moved. Second. First by Trustee Gracia, second by Trustee Dooley. Student board rep? Aye. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody oppose or abstain? Motion passes, thank you. And now onto item L1, um, L1A with enrollment report. Just feel the need to highlight that it's more bad news. We've lost more students. The enrollment decline continues. Thank you, Trustee Gracia. Item L1B, final demographic analysis and facility capacity report. This is um, just a report for us. Comments? I'll just um, do a quick orientation. This is the uh, official report that accompanied the presentation that we received from right. um, King Consulting, the last, uh, last board meeting, regular business meeting. Was that the regular business meeting? No. We heard from King at the special board meeting and then saw them the week, a board meeting in March. Yes. <laughs> I can't remember which one. Maybe it was the last one in March. He made a presentation. So this, is yes. the, this is the official report yes. um, that's now complete. Yeah. And I think notably uh, comments came up about the city of Napa's planning uh, documents the build out projections uh, in a general plan context are completely different from a demographic analysis of this sort. Um, they are for regional planning purposes and they represent if buildings are actually built, um, this is what, how we would plan for it, not these are, these are being built. And so the, these projections, demographic analysis is more on the ground than a general plan demo analysis, so. Thank you. Are there any additional suggestions and comments from board members or um, superintendent? Um, I do just wanna quickly comment um, at the last board meeting, we talked about adding to the informational items, um, uh, a monthly report uh, on chronic absenteeism that was requested by trustee Gracia. I wanna let you know that I have um, staff, uh, Mr. Drew Heron still in the meeting with us and Mr. Mike Mansway who oversees student services and uh, child welfare and attendance. We will start that practice next month and then carry it through next year. And uh, it'll be added for the last board meeting of the month, every month. Just wanted to welcome everybody to Friday. I wanted to say that first, <laughs> Trustee Gracia. <laughs> I was looking at my phone too. Okay. Um, all right. Any future agenda items? I do have one. I, do. Oh, I knew it. Yeah. So uh, we approved a lot of programs last June that we needed for our distance learning. Um, and so now we're coming up on a year that we've been using those programs. And I'm interested to see which, if any, we will need in uh, actual in-person learning. Uh, and which ones were maybe effective and which ones were less so. I would love to hear uh, where we are as far as evaluating all of those programs. Actually, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Okay, I think that's been, that's been noted. Anything else? 
All right, so someone Move would like to, to adjourn. Thank you. I'll second. Our first by Trustee Gracia, a second by Trustee Dooley, <laughs> student board rep. Aye. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstain? All right. No, I want to stay another hour. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. This has been fun. <laughs> this concludes our meeting. <laughs>